Makeup game. It rained earlier in the year, and we lost the game with Detroit. So this is a makeup game. It's a four-game series now. We play here tomorrow, Saturday, and Sunday against the Detroit Tigers. Sparky Anderson, the new manager for the Tigers, he replaced Les Moss, and I thought this was a shame for a guy who worked his way up in that Tiger organization and then lost his job before he had really a chance to prove himself. For the Tigers, Ron LaFleur will lead it off and play center field. Steve Kemp will be in left field and bat second. Jason Thompson will bat fourth. Check that. Let's go back again. LaFleur will lead it off. Whitaker will bat second. He'll be at second base. Steve Kemp will be in left field. Between the fireworks, the music, the disco music, the burning of the, the, at the thing. You know, you're lucky you don't go nuts here. You know, I've been there. I, I want to tell you, there's a big chance of going nuts. How can you even read the lineup when you can't even think? Right now, there's 30,000 kids, and they got dirty signs all over this park. <laughs> I want to tell you. Unbelievable. A guy like me who never thinks like anything like they're putting on out here. This is unbelievable. I want to tell you. But let's get back to the lineup. Whitaker will bat second and be at second base. Kemp will be in left field. Thompson will be at first base. John Summers will be in right field. They got him from Cincinnati. Rusty Staub will be the designated hitter. Lance Parrish, a fine young catcher, will be behind the plate. Tom Brookins, I don't know if I pronounced that name right. It sounds like a milk root, will be at third base. And Alan Trammell will be at shortstop. On the mound, Pat Underwood from Kokomo, Indiana. Boys, why not? I think you guys should be pitching from Kokomo, Indiana tonight. For the White Sox, Alan Bannister, who has really been hitting that ball and driving a lot of runs of late, will lead it off again tonight, be at second base. Junior Moore will be in left field, he'll bat second. Chet Lemon will be in center field, he'll bat third. Lamar Johnson will bat fourth, he'll be at first base. Wayne Nordhagen, he'll be the designated hitter. Rusty Torres will be in left field. Jim Morrison, the young rookie up, will be at third base. He got a base hit last night and drove in a run. Also stole a base. Greg Pryor will be at shortstop, and boy, he played super defensive ball last night. Mike Colburn will be behind the plate, and on the mound, 22-year-old Fred Howard. We'll be right back with all the action here and a little bit about the pitchers right after this message. 3.72, he's 6'3", 190 pounds, he's 22 years old. He's making his 30, 13th appearance, his fifth start be his first start against the Tigers in his short major league career. He lost his last outing and released against Minnesota 2-1. to one. He pitched well, but he got the loss. Fastball, curveball, slider. He can be very effective when he keeps the ball down. He has one big trouble, too. He has trouble going by the fifth inning, so let's hope tonight he can get the job done. Pat Underwood, his brother Tom, pitches for the Toronto Blue Jays, he defeated him in his first outing, beat him one to nothing. He's now 3-0 with an ERA of 3.78. He's 6'3", 190 pounds, he's 22 years old. As I said before, he's from Kokomo, Indiana. He was the number one draft choice in 1976 in June of the Detroit Tigers. He has pitched a lot in the minor leagues for the last three years. He's 23 and 14 in the minor leagues, but has done very well since he's come up. He throws harder than his brother, does not quite have the curveball he has, but he's got good stuff. He has good control and he knows how to pitch. So it ought to be a pretty good duel here in the first game of the doubleheader with Fred Hauer out for the White Sox. Behind the plate, Mike Colburn. Underwood for the Tigers. Behind the plate, Lance Parrish. We'll be right back with play-by-play -play action and Harry Carey right here at Comiskey Park where the fans will be going wild all night. On Deck has been brought to you by Howard Pontiac, where Howard's mother makes sure you get a great deal. Howard Pontiac on Grand Avenue between York Road and Route 83. <laughs> Chicago White Sox are brought to you by the following participating advertisers. Schlitz. Beer makes it good. Schlitz makes it great. And by the Association of Chicagoland McDonald's Restaurants. Nobody can do it like McDonald's can. And by True Value Hardware Stores. True Value. More than just a name, it's our way of doing business. And by Commonwealth Edison, the company that's working for you. And by the people in our town who bottle delicious Coca-Cola. Cocats Light to Chicago White Sox Baseball. And by Interlake Incorporated, a Chicago-based company in metals and material handling.
sponsors of White Sox baseball for seven consecutive years. And by American Family Insurance. All your family protection under one roof for your auto, home, business, health, and life. And by the 46 Chicagoland Midas dealers who say when it comes to your car, it pays to Midasize. Hello again, everybody. Harry Carey and Jimmy Pearsall from Comiskey Park, where we're going to have a, a wild night tonight, a twin-eyed doubleheader. And the th theme song seems to be, if you believe all these signs around here, and the center field bleachers are already jammed, and according to the, the disc jockey of the station, Loop, which is sponsoring the teenager night here, Disco sucks. That's <laughs> Look at that crowd out there. Harry, now I want to ask you one question. You told me when I came to work with you three years ago that you would help me out, but out here tonight, this is bad for my, uh, I don't know. Morals? My mor well, I don't have any morals. <laughs> hey, I want them to see the shirt you're wearing. How about that shirt, Harry? And I want Can you make that out? It says outpatients. I think everybody should. Now hold up your legs. <laughs> He's wearing shorts. Boy, oh boy, oh boy. There's more beef on those legs. Why don't you get in shape? Hey, Harry, I want to tell you right now. How about my catch? It's really what Let's talk about my catch. Let's lesson. talk about your catch. All right. <laughs> more Harry. sensational play. Oh, Our national you anthem. You say for the dance line. What's so proud? Stripes and bright stars through the perilous fight are the rivers we watch who were so gallantly streaming. And the rocket red glare, the bombs bursting in there, came from the night. for two in a row. He looks nice. He's all dressed up in yellow and brown. How come you tried to steal the show from me? I made the great catch last night, and the people tell me you're the one who kept talking about it. <laughs> about, what a, about your good, excellent coaching, how you told me to move. And... Well, I, I gave you a little shove, Harry, but you know, one thing about you, you worked me up. <laughs> you worked so hard, you know, you're conscientious in your writing a lot of times. But you did, you did make a nice catch, Harry, and I, I wish you well for the rest of the year. <laughs> well, they want the banners to be removed. Well, there's some dandies up there. And the center field bleachers are already jammed. And here we are, the game, the first game of the night doubleheader hasn't even started. It's 85 degrees, the wind is out of the east. About 10 miles an hour. Fred Howard getting his practice tosses. Boy, the more you talk to that Steve Trout, the more you understand why he is having such such success. The kid knows exactly what, what it's all about, what he is trying to do, and why. You know, he seems, Harry, to be throwing the ball harder. Talking to Colburn after the game last night in the dugout, he said, Jim, he was throwing it, he got to believe, as fast as he'd ever caught a ball in his life, and it was hurting his hand. So the indication is that he's getting stronger as he goes along instead of weaker. There's a change in the Detroit lineup. Stretch Kemp, batting third. Fred Howard is six feet three, 190 pounds. He's 22 years old. He's been pitching better. He's making his 13th appearance, even though he lost two to one in Minnesota in relief. It's a 10 inning ball game. Hinton gave up the hit that caused them to lose the ball game. He's a low ball pitcher, and when he pitches low, he can be awfully tough. 
He's got to prove to me that he can pitch over five innings, though. He's yet to be able to go by five. Well, he's a big kid. You'd think he's strong enough. I think it's just a matter of getting his feet on the ground. Well, the bullpen will really do it for you. I'm convinced, Jimmy, that there, after watching young Steve, that there is such a thing as heritage. Because this father was a great pitcher, and I think it just comes naturally more to Steve. By heritage, Harry, that means you're left a lot of money plus ability. <laughs> well, they are ready to go. They made a change in the lineup. Jose Morales is going to play left field in place of Steve Kemp. Staub will be the DH, but bat third. And we're ready to play ball. They want him to take the banners down off the left field and right field wall. You know what they say in those signs, don't you? That's just what those kids are saying to that announcer. <laughs> they, are, they have worked hard to make those signs, and they sure don't want to take them down. There you see Sparky Anderson. Hey, Harry, this guy, a very strong disciplinarian. Is that one of his best traits? Oh, I had a, I did an interview with him. I'm going to do him on uh, television tomorrow night before the game at 7.15. I did an interview with him on radio, and he, he had a... He talked in depth about the necessary character to turn a boy into a winning type of ball player. Here's LaFleur to lead it off. First pitch, a slider strike. One strike to nothing. Nice crowd on a muggy night. There's a pitch into the dirt. Colburn behind the plate. Is that Derwood Kirby down at third base umpiring? Or? Um, <laughs> Derwood Merrill. Derwood. Merrill. <laughs> Slider a little high. Two balls and a strike. Bouncing ball. Nice play. Morrison throws him out. Darwin Merle is the umpire at third base. Hey, Harry, you know who's the best looking guy in this club now? Is that Morrison? He's a handsome kid. So put Merrill, the umpire at third. Dallas Parks is at second. Dave Phillips is behind the plate. Dan Morrison at third. There is Lou, sweet Lou Whitaker hitting 306. Okay. That's Morrison at first. Yeah. Sam Morris. Sam Morris. One ball, no strikes, one out. Good to have LaFleur off those bases. He only leaves the American League in stolen bases with 45. Two balls, no strikes. Boy, we can win this game. Have Ken Kravick to go against him in the second game. He also has scored 62 runs. The floor. Our leading run score is Bannister with 46. Walked him on four pitches. Here's Rusty Staub now. Hitting 228. Nine homers, 38 RBIs. Whitaker has stolen nine bases. He's been caught stealing five times. He's got pretty good speed. The Detroit Tigers under Sparky Anderson. Fastball high. That's five pitches in a row. Without a strike. Right now he's throwing standing up straight. He has got to turn his right side and really bend his back. Good pitcher generally gets through the ball game. He's got to soar back. One ball, no strikes. Fred Howard ready. Whitaker lead. Throw over there. He's back. Whitaker will go to third. Maybe there's a throw. They got a chance, but it's wide. 
Rusty Torres playing right field. His throw was towards left field up the line. So they threaten in the very first inning. I feel awfully slow here. No matter how hard you hit the ball, it just sucks it right up. It's spongy and it's really hard to wait for the ball. You've got to come as fast as you can to pick it up. Now the infield will play back Jason Thompson hitting 270. Nine homers and 47 runs batted in. Howard's allowed a base on balls and a hit. And the Tigers threaten with runners at first and third. Big rock and roll crowd. There's a stretch, the pitch, strike off. You know, Jimmy, we have had, I always thought it was the number one rock station here, WLS, sponsoring these teenager nights for years now. They've never produced a crowd like this. So this station must have a heck of an audience. It's WNUP. Remember last night, I was trying to figure out how to say it. I was trying to get the W in there. One loop, one loop. As much as you spend time in the loop, Harry. You know. <laughs> near north side. You, oh, you never walked out by the loop, huh? Very seldom. Very seldom. Want to go to see Jimmy Gallios and Miller's or Jim Janik of Bohemia? That's all. Slider in there, good strike. Boy, Jason Thompson really upset with him. I can't believe that ball was a strike. They're playing behind Staub because he he probably is the slowest runner in both leagues, but he can hit. Two strikes on the ball. Fred Howard ready. Another dangerous left-hand hitter next. Champ Summers, who used to be with the Cubs and the Reds. The pitch. A little wide. Steve Kemp was hit over the eye in feeling practice. He has an ice pack on his eye, and that's why he was scratched. Foul! Ooh, what a cut that Jason Thompson has. Boy, you, you can understand why he hit so many home runs. He, rubbed, he really lets it all hang out. Two balls, two strikes. Infield playing back, hoping for a double play. Watch it. High ball three. Kind of interesting, Harry. Detroit is sixth in their league with a 41-44 record. Only three under 500. That's right. That's what happens when you have teams like the Red Sox and Baltimore and Milwaukee in there and the Yankees. Cleveland is even ahead of them. Three balls, two strikes. The runner on first probably will be going. Fred Howard, 22-year-old right-hander. There goes Staub. Foul back. Staub just fake going. Hey, one-handed cat. By a long-haired fan in the upper deck who immediately gets a kiss. Two kisses. Three kisses and you're out. Three balls, two strikes. You did call him a long-haired fan, did you? Yeah. <laughs> well, the long-haired fan was the guy. The gal was kissing. Here's a pitch. Struck him out. The throw through. Oh, oh. come on. That was slow covering, and the throw goes wild. One to nothing. Boy, I wish you'd held up. Rusty Staub had that mind all the way to stop. That is a stolen base. The man scored on E2. Look at that. You know, Harry Pryor got there. It's just a terrible throw on Colbert's part on an easy play. All he's got to do is flip it. He tries to throw every ball through a wall. And you don't have to do that. You've got to get yourself in a rhythm with the same velocity. 
So it's an unearned run. They have a runner at second with two out now. Here's Champ Summers hitting 311 for the year. You know, the pitcher works hard to get out of, get out of a jam and then it's that good baseball. This this guy got about nine home runs too? Yeah, he's got nine homers. Here's with the Cubs in 75 and 76. Then he had 34 homers at the Cincinnati Farm Club. Last year. There's a line drive in the left field down of Acock by Junior Moore. Summers line to Moore. One run, one hit, one air, one left. We're going to the bottom of the first one to nothing Detroit. Harry Carey back in the ballpark. We're going to the bottom of the first inning Detroit leading one to nothing on an unearned run. In earlier this year, the White Sox defeated not once but twice Tom Underwood, a left-handed pitcher with the Toronto Blue Jays. Now his brother, Pat Underwood, is pitching with the Tigers. Pat Underwood also a left-hander. In a recent game, the first one that Pat pitched, he defeated Tom Underwood one to nothing. That's what you call a, a family pitching duel. He's smaller than Tom. And he's younger than Tom. They say he throws harder than Tom. They say his velocity is a little bit better because <coughs> his brother has a great curveball. No doubt about it, one of the better curveballs in the American League, but his fastball has not done him justice. But this kid here, they say, has got a pretty good curve, good slider, and he got good control. So he's he's 123 and lost 14 overall in the minor leagues in the overall picture for three years. He was the number one draft choice in June of 1976 of the Tigers. So he's earned his way here. Here's Alan Bannister to lead off. I wonder if their mother and father are left-handed too. Unusual to have two sons both left-handed. If they were both right-handed, you wouldn't think anything of it. Or one right-handed, one left-handed, maybe. But both left-handed, it proves, again, about bloodlines. The Perry brothers were both right-handed, and I know his dad was right-handed because I played golf with him. <laughs> Bannister takes a strike. Good fastball. The only difference between the Perry brothers and the father, the father is about six feet seven, about 235. <laughs> one ball, one strike. There's a smash. Base hit, extra base, and maybe. Bannister going for two. And he'll make it easily. Bannister opens with a double to left. He pulled that ball right down the third baseline. Bannister stings another one. As I said before, that outfield grass is slow. Right by the third baseman. Morales has got a long way to come, and that ball slows right up. And Banny, who can run, and by running, I mean he knows how to run. Did you notice how he tagged that bag? on the inside part and saved about two or three steps. That's his 99th hit of the year. There's Junior Moore. Bouncing ball. He gave himself up on that. Whitaker will throw him out, but Bannister goes to third. You can see Junior Moore deliberately trying to hit to the first base side. Seems to me that there's where a guy should be credited with a sacrifice. I believe that too. He should have some kind of credit. Now watch as Harry said, he goes right out there. That lower hand goes out towards the second baseman. But you know, they're so stubborn, these sports writers and these guys that are on the committee for judging these things, that they won't make changes. Baseball took them 100 years to make one change. They lowered the mound. It took them 100 years to do that. <laughs> Here's Lem Lemonade, the only all-star team representative of the White Sox. Ooh, Ooh nice almost hit him. Hey. Lemon's been hit ten times already. What a touch of class this kid behind the plate is. Parrish right up in there with these guys now with Sunbird. Lemon batting 301 with nine homers, 45 runs batted in. The tying run at third. Low inside, ball two. Up on the board, they welcome the American Airlines flagship nightclub. I like the way these kids took their signs down there and they went right to it. They got them right down. And they right back up. up. 
Line drive to the shortstop. Too bad. Boy, that kid's fooling nobody right now. That's two out. Here's Lamar Johnson. Lamar hitting 298, seven homers, 37 runs batted in. Chet Lemon hit that ball right on the button. You know, it seems like we get behind ball games the last four or five games, but always manage to struggle through. Remember when Banny made the error last night? You said, that's the way we're going to win it anyways. I heard you. I remember you saying that. See, I listened to you. <laughs> Every now and then you listen. <laughs> There's a pitch a little bit low, a curveball. Jill Blick celebrating her 14th birthday here. This program is owned by WSNS TV through exclusive rights granted by the Chicago White Sox. It's telecast solely for an entertainment for audience. Any reproduction or the use of this play by play description and account of this game without the express written consent of WSNS TV is prohibited. Downloads from this game. I agree with every word you said. Yeah. One ball, no strikes. Good fastball at the knee. Good friend of Guy Hoffman's, a fine young left-hander of the White Sox. Oscar Liss in Ottawa. We wish him a speedy recovery. There's a pitch into the dirt. Another good save by Lance Parrish. You know, as Harry with the changeup and you young players watch it, he just went to his right, right down on both knees to make sure that ball doesn't go by. Two balls and a strike. Boy, he had a fool on a curveball. Change of pace. Our photographer down there, Vic Track, did a little, a little rock and roll to get out of the way, and then flipped the ball into the stand. Curveball low inside, ball three. North Hagen will be next. Three balls, two strike. Pat Underwood from Kokomo, Indiana. Three-two pitch. Line drive, left center, going to be caught easily by LaFleur. We got the long fly too late. No runs, one hit, no errors, one left. At the end of one, the Tigers won, the White Sox nothing. Harry Carey and Jimmy Pearsall, we go down to the top of the second inning, one to nothing in favor of the Detroit Tigers. In the skybox tonight, the White Sox would like to welcome Liftronics Group in a patio. Kenilworth, Boy Scouts. In bullpen number one, McDermott, Will, and Emery group to the bullpen. Welcome McDermott and Will and Emery. Okay, I'll buy that. <laughs> and also Steve Shrinker and RS Graphics. Shrinker, not Shrinker. <laughs> You're thinking of your doctor. <laughs> well, I got my shirt on today, and I'm a little bit shook up. <laughs> <laughs> Swung and missed by Julio Morales. Now in the corner saloon, now I'm going to get this one right, Charles Akey and Pick Congress would like to welcome Don Davis and friends. There's a line smash knocked down by Morris and picks it up and fire. Too late. Boy, that ball was really creamed, a base hit for Morales. Howard's not exactly fooling him. Watch, Watch this it. now, Morales. Gets a ball right up by his shoulders and just rips it. Young man at third, Morrison, did a good job stopping it. Now he tries to throw him out, but Morales beats it easy. Oh, oh no. my goodness. E5. Oh, oh my world. boy, oh boy. I ought to get that guy and let him play oh, in a yeah, different game. Ball. How can you give him an error? How in the world can he get an error on that? It almost knocked him down. Would you ask him? Who's the score? It's it's Dozer. Dozer, that figures. He may be the worst official scorer in the history of the game. There's Lance Parrish. There goes the runner. There's the peg. God. Bad throw. Well, he hasn't learned to throw at all, has he, Harry, huh? When he thinks about throwing, he throws poorly. When he just lets the ball go, he throws well. Boy, oh boy, I can't understand. Watch this. Watch this now. He throws see it right on the ground. See how deliberate he was? And look, he tries to overthrow the ball and just throws it terrible. He's going to get somebody hurt out there. You know, when you want to get in a groove, it's like throwing to third base when the outfield. You try to get that same groove to throw all the time. Not overthrowing it. Parrish. Right-handed batter, the delivery now. High fly ball should be caught. That's Junior Moore. 
the runner not going anywhere. One out. You know, there is supposed to be some equity in scoring. Now, Julio Morales deserved a hit. He had a low line drive that the third baseman couldn't even get his glove up in time. Bet, hit him in the chest. I bet you he wasn't even looking at the play. You know how many times they're looking down at what they're doing for tomorrow and getting set up and typing on that machine? That's why they so frequently change it after they, if somebody talks to them. Here's Tom Brookins, a rookie just up. Some debris was thrown down out of the upper deck. And... Brookins hitting 429, a right-handed batter. Some paper's been thrown out of the field of streamer. Boy, straddles have played wide. He was popping the ball into the stands in batting practice. The pitch swings and he misses. I'm glad to see him playing. That guy Rodriguez, he must take at least five runs a year away from us. Spark Anders is moving men around. He's trying to find out about his players. He's got a five-year contract, and he knows his responsibility is to win before those five years are up. There's a pitch low, so Sparky knows what it takes to win a title. And that's what he's looking for. Well, I'll tell you what, he'll know before he's through. If he moves guys around, he doesn't win in Detroit. Those fans are running out of town. Ball and a strike. Tom Brookins, the third baseman. There's a drive that'll score a run. Brookins lines one into the left field corner. He's going for extra bases. And he may try for three. Here's a throw. Nothing to the throw, and he makes it. A triple. That's Brookins' fourth hit and eight times at bat since he came to the big league. So that's why he's using Brookins. Watch this right now. He hits a low slider. Moore, instead of getting over in front of the ball as it comes off the wall, he plays it on the side a little bit. See? And the bounce back on his right is a tough play. You know, the wire in that fence there, Harry, in the lower part of it there, the picnic, picnic area, area yeah. when it hits those wire meshes, it just bounces funny. One time one way, another time another. So now the infield is in with one out. It's already two to nothing in favor of the Tigers. Fred Howard's pitch. The squeeze is on. He bunts foul. Alan Trammell, the batter. Nobody warming up, and Howard really not having too much. He's been hit awfully hard here in the first two innings. Big crowd's going to be on hand here tonight. Harry, look at this. I want you to remember this. An elaborate funeral wreath shows up at the site where an unidentified body is buried. Saturday at 5 on the Untouchables. Don't forget that now, Coach. That's one thing about the Untouchables. They always send pretty flowers to funerals. That's right. We had a few <laughs> in New York today. Play inside. The count is evened up in a ball and a strike. Two to nothing in favor of Detroit. Must be, oh, they're really hitting the ball. They must be. He's going to go a long way because there's nobody warming up. Infield in. The pitch to Allen Trammell. Bouncing ball. Pryor's going to throw to the plate. He is out trying to throw. Pryor had to go to his left. His throw was into the dirt, but Colburn came up with it and made the tag. The well, he made a wonderful decision on that. I'd like to see that again. Nice play by Pryor, who has to move to his left, as you'll see in a moment. Here you'll see it now. Pryor releases quickly. Watch how quick he releases that ball. And he throws a strike. Colber now, right on the plate, makes the tag out in front. Gets him by plenty. Good yep. play by Pryor. Pryor's been playing outstanding shortstop. Oh, wherever they put him. The streamers of paper continue to be thrown onto the field, and I would imagine that we're going to have a lot of delays here tonight. Two to nothing in favor of the Tigers, the ball game in the top of the second. 
First game of a night doubleheader. Harry, we were just talking a moment ago about the fans booing in Detroit. For precautionary X-ray, that's his right side. John Hiller said it's his last year, no matter what, because the fans have been booing him uh, off and on, and he's had some great years there. Last year he was nine and four with 15 saves, and that's just one of the better years he's had. Yeah, but he's 36 years old. I would imagine he would be retiring anyway. You see there, they're booing Luzinski in Philadelphia, too. Quick throw to first, the runner back. I'll tell you, when you get booed at home, it's time to quit because it's tough to work it under those conditions. Runner back. They're still coming into the ballpark. Ground ball to Morrison. He's got it. Throws to Bannister for the force play. And it's one run. Really two hits, but they only credit one. Harry Carey back in the ballpark. We're going to the bottom of the second. Wayne Nard Hagen's going to be leading it off. Nard Hagen hitting 268. Five homers, 17 RBI. Hey, see where the White Sox signed up. Bobby Douglas is going to their Iowa Farm Club and probably will be pitching tomorrow night or Saturday night. That's going to be interesting. Here's a fellow who's played professional football for 10 years, and now at age 32, he's going to take up professional baseball. You know, now I have told so many kids when I was managing to go get a job because they were too old and they weren't going anywhere. Here's a guy 32 years old, hasn't got anybody out yet. Here's Dart Hagen. Straddles the plate waiting. Underwood's first pick. Slider a little bit inside. Bobby Bond says that he's going to play out his contract. Who's Wants to be him? traded. Who's going to take him 440000 a year? There's a pitch a little bit low and inside. Brad Carbon. He already had him. He went that route. He's, he's got to circle a little bit. Well, he's got a contract as a uh, guarantee for three more years. Two balls, no strikes. Swung on, ground ball, easy out. Trammell's got it. One away. Here's Rusty Torrey. The Tigers have won three out of four this year from the White Sox. <laughs> Crowd still gathering here. We're going to have a fine turnout. You're really pacing yourself for a long night, you know yeah, that? Yeah, right. <laughs> long, hot. <laughs> and I think it's going to be a very eventful night. One out, nobody on. There's a drive. Fair ball into the corner. What's he doing? He must have missed first base. the first base umpire you know the worst thing in the world you youngsters remember this and I've told him and I've told every one of them hit this ball good don't watch the ball watch the ball after you tag the bag you know, I didn't oh, yeah. tell couldn't tell he's going back to first when the ball is in the left field corner hey let's wake up boys One out, one on. Here's Jim Morrison. He's one out of three with the White Sox. And drove in a run. Swings and a breaking ball and he missed. Morrison has faced all these guys and played against most of them. Summers. I pronounce that third baseman, Brooken. Brookens. Brookens. Playing deep at third base. Line foul. Well, I tell you, we got a lot of very attractive young people here. <laughs> I never heard of this station, Loop. Loop. But uh, my respect and regard for them is soaring to new heights. They fill the ballpark. What kind of music do they play? Rock and roll. Rock and roll. The 
Well, they won't get my boy. Foul tip. I FM. They hate this three. Yeah, they're 98, I think. 98. They can blow up their, their records, too. Two strikes or nothing. Time call. Let's see what's been thrown out there now. Banners all over the place. And they've certainly come supplied with streamers of paper. What do you think? We're going to have about 40? No, we may. You know, it's just the first game. And now, people don't start coming to ballpark till around 7 o'clock. And the way these seats are spaced out. Angel Fonticcio. Sounds like a... Watch it again right away. <laughs> he sounds like... He sounds like a wrestler who just lost the girl. Oh. <laughs> I think. <laughs> Boy, we're both in trouble, but isn't. Two strikes. What's new? Two strikes What's in the ball. about getting in trouble? But Steve Dahl must have a great audience. Bouncing foul outside third. I went to the library today to look up some words about law. I couldn't find them. What was that? Do that again, that Mike. Rick got another one. Rick Truck, a third base cameraman. Truck him out on a breaking ball. I'll bring up Greg Pryor. Harry, he's got good motion on a change, and right there, he had the kid way out in front. I guess that's the secret to baseball today, is really, really being able to get your two breaking balls over, which changes speeds. George Cronus and his son Jeffrey are here with Andy Carafotius and Paul Demas. Joe Nucky and his nephews are all here, little leaguers. Our good friend Joe, the bartender at Sweetwater, Doug Buffon's establishment. Pryor takes it low and outside. A group here from Butch McGuire's on Division Street. I guess Butch's place really started the singles bars in Chicago. Pryor hitting 285. Takes it low. Boy, this Underwood really pitches like a like a veteran. A seasoned veteran is right. He changes up on that fastball with the same motion that he gives you on his good hard stuff. Two balls, no strikes. Line foul outside third. For Torres, missing first base, really hurt instead of being at second base. In scoring position, with one out. He's still at first base with two out. So it takes an extra base hit to score. The pitch. Line down the left field line. Fair ball. Torres made score. The ball gets away from the left fielder. He will. Two to one ball game. Fire doubles to left scoring. Rusty Torres. Pryor's 22nd run batted in this year. Watch Pryor now guarding that plate, gets a low fastball and rips it right into the corner. Morales now having the same trouble off that wall as Moore had. Look how that ball just jumps out there. Torrey's going to score easy and gets himself out of a jam for not tagging first base. <laughs> Boy, he feels better sitting right down. Now. Boy, am I glad. Just think if we needed that run and we lost by a run. Yeah. Two to one in favor of the Tigers. Again, the game is delayed. The streamers are paper coming out of the upper deck in center field. And now the right fielder, Summers. I think I inadvertently said Summers in left field a moment ago. It was Morales who was having difficulty as the ball rolled around the corner. There was no chance to get Rusty Torres anyhow because with two out, he was running all the way. Summers is in right. 
LaFleur and Sonny Morales and left. A lot of clubs off tonight, huh? A lot of clubs off in baseball. A lot of clubs aren't playing tonight around the league. Yeah, a lot of open days. Seattle won 16 to 1 over the New York Yankees. Tommy John. They have beaten the Yankees five straight times at their ballpark. Have a winning streak of five in a row over them. And I think they've beat them something like 10 out of the last 13 at Seattle. Hey, you know, Harry, also reading in the paper this morning where is Sunberg. Oh, yeah. Uh, now, I. I don't understand why Sunberg, who is having a tough year and comes in here and really, we love him as a catcher, but has not been doing that good a job against us. A guy stole second easy on him last night. Of course, we give him the benefit of the doubt when the other two guys stole. He struck out with a, in, a, in a position where he could have drove in some runs. And then he says he looks out at the play of our players and it makes him want to puke. It must have been his hemorrhoids that caused that, Harry. Well, no, i tell you something. That's why some clubs have a 15-minute cooling-off period. And I think they should have. Now, we know Jim Sunberg uh, yeah. normally is a very, just a great kid. But in the so frustrated about losing again to the White Sox, he popped off something he wouldn't ordinarily say. And I think the ball player deserves that 15-minute or, or 20-minute cooling-off period so they can collect his thoughts before having to face the press. I used to love to play with Ted Williams because they cooled off for 12 minutes and they never came in the clubhouse before the game. You never see these guys, you see, sneaking around. Who's this guy? Where did he come from? Who give that guy a card? Get him out. You couldn't talk to your guy next to you without somebody listening from behind. But when you're with Ted Williams, you never saw him in there. He throw him out the window. Here's a pitch now to Colburn. Bouncing ball that'll end this inning. Trammell's got it. Easy out. Colburn on the first pitch rolls out. One run, two hits, no errors, one left. At the end of two, the Tigers are leading two to one. You'll never be a manager. Harry Carey with Jimmy Pearsall. We go on to the top of the third. It's two to one in favor of the Tigers. They're here from Muskegon where they watch our games on cable. Jeff, Jim, Craig, and Carl. I imagine we have a lot of Michiganders here. Here's a bunt by Sweet Lou Whitaker foul. They're from J.C. Penny in Yorktown, a big group. And also from the Aurora Area Blood Bank. One strike and nothing. Panel takes a low and inside. Friends are here from Whiting, Indiana, from Sportsman's of Piklansky, Arbic, Kantowski, and Schertzmann. Fellows never miss a game. 1-1 one, one pitch. High, ball two. Outfield, not too deep, but over towards left center. <laughs> Here's a pitch, and it's high. Three balls and a strike. <laughs> Jimmy last season said he liked to know a good-looking grandmother. He didn't like the baby sister types. <laughs> so a young senior sizzler slipped the note to him. You should read it. <laughs> she even give you her I phone number. I couldn't dare read it. <laughs> There. Boy, there's old people like that do those kind of things. Here's a pitch swung on a little bouncing uh -oh. ball. The pitch is going to cover the top. Out on a close play. Boy, I tell you, Howard just barely got there in time. Boy, you can see this play right away. He just hits a high hopper. Now, over to his right goes Johnson. This is a tough play. He's got to throw across his body. Now, watch him have to feel for the bag. He doesn't know where the bag is. Boy, he just got it by hair. Jimmy, you gotta be careful. Throw that thing away. It's burning my hands. <laughs> just says right about the right name. Did so you right get address. arrested for molesting a, se a senior citizen grandmother? He said, but the telephone number is unlisted, so she puts the number up here. But I just want to tell you right now. <laughs> that's a new experience for me, Harry. <laughs> well, from one grandfather to a grandmother, it's nice to know you. <laughs> There's a pitch a little bit inside. A ball and a strike. Now we'll get, we'll get 
I guess we'll get a memo on that, Jimmy. <laughs> but the grandmother, nobody will, nobody will write her a letter and say, don't do those kind of things. 1-1 one, one pitch. I'm a little... You mean if I get an old mobile home down in Florida, you get those kind of calls? <laughs> oh, I love it. Well, I... I love it. The world is full of fun. Well, according to Masters of Johnson... <laughs> It's going to be a long night here. We might as well live it up a little. Three balls and a strike. Senior citizens love that kind of stuff, too. One out, nobody on. Strike call to Rusty Stobb, who got a base hit his first time. The count is full at three and two. We're in the top of the third. Two to one in favor of the Tigers. Boy, we're going to have a wonderful crowd. They got a chant here. I don't want to turn it down. Listen here, that three two pitch. Pull foul outside first. Gates Seniors. Brown coaching at first base. Dick Trzuski at third base. Senior citizens, ladies, should hear that chant. Woo! But when it, about oh, I'd say about ten o'clock when they start that again, Harry, they'll knock the joint down. <laughs> three balls, two strikes. Gang here from Ireland's restaurant tonight. Pull foul. And the Rookin family from Sarasota, Florida. The Don Rookin. Rudin. Howard has been keeping the ball down much better. He got single runs off in the first two innings. Three balls, two strikes. On Rusty Stop. Walked him, ball four. That's a second base on ball. He's fan one. He's given up two hits. The Fazios and the Glendine and uh, Glendine Conrad are here from Germany. One out, a runner at first. Hey, Harry, I've got a promo to read here. The Spider-Man, does he have a slogan, too? You better let me read that before you read it on the air. After reading your letter from the grandmother, I better, I better proofread this one. I want to tell you, Granny. That's all right. <laughs> <laughs> oh my. <laughs> Let's get a double play. One out, one on. There's a pitch high. A ball and a strike. Boy, you get a letter like that from a grandmother. So many wives always have headaches. One ball, one strike. Stop's not going anywhere. He doesn't run at all. Jason Thompson, the hitter, and long ball threat. Boy, look where Moore is. He has given him all of left field. He'd like to have him go that way because he doesn't have the power that he has to right field. The delivery. Strike at the knee. Two balls, two strikes. I get them today, isn't it? It's all right, folks. We're just reading our mail. <laughs> Let's get a double play. Two balls, two strikes. Broke. High fly ball. He didn't quite get it. And it's going to be catchable. Torres is there. That's two away, and it brings up Champ Summers, who lined the ball hard right at Junior Moore in the first inning. Another great Friday, which is tomorrow the 13th, is planned as the White Sox take on Detroit again. The first 10,000 youngsters, 14 and under, with paid adult, will get a free Presto Magic kit from Papermate, a division of Gillette. That's not all now. 
Spider-Man will be on hand to entertain the youngsters, and there will be magic tricks everywhere. Whoopee, boy, Harry, they're gonna, they're gonna see if they can disappear the two of us. <laughs> Spider-Man. Two men are on. I hope this park is left here after the war night. The delivery, strike call. Summers is at nine homers already. He's really, really done a terrific job since the Tigers brought him up. They acquired him from the Cincinnati Reds. You know, the one thing they had was infielders. The one thing we've had is outfielders in our organization. So the Tigers, just the reverse of our club, has gone out and come up with a couple of players. One strike or nothing. The pitch. Off speed outside. That evens it up a ball and a strike. Boy, they got banners all over the place. This is Disco Demolition Night. The 1-1 one, one pitch. Low and inside. As I understand the background of this uh, promotion, the Steve Dahl, or Dahl, was a disc jockey on, on a station here that played rock and roll, and they switched to disco music. There's a pitch smash, one hop. Right at Bannister. Better hurry. He can't. Now let's see what he's going to call that one. Now that one I thought should have been an error. He's asking three people on this one because he isn't getting it right away. He's looking for the replay, what he's doing right now. Base hit. That's a hit. The other one that almost knocked down Morrison was an error. That, too, could be a hit because it bounced up and hit him on his shoulder, but not near as hard hit as the ball that went to Morrison. Now, well, here's Morales, who singled his first time up and then stole second. Two men are on. Two men are on. What happens to Banny, Harry? He gets himself flat-footed. He can't be agile. Strike call at the knee. One strike or nothing. Well, anyway, the Steve down because the station changed their format to disco, was fired. So, so as I hear it, he got a new job on this WLUP, the loop. And so he's hated disco music ever since, because it cost him a job. There's a line drive, may drive in both runs. One run scores, another man goes to third. So Morales, Lines a single or right center to make it three to one. Harry, no matter what happens from here on in, if we don't tighten up our defense, especially in the infield, it becomes a very upsetting thing to the fans, upsetting to the management. You've got to put people where they belong, and we certainly have not been able to. I guess Kessinger may not want to play anymore. Uh, I don't doubt that he would like to, but he's got to try to build for the future for this organization. So they've got to go out and get themselves a second baseman. Banny is definitely a left fielder. I don't blame Bannister. No, I don't either. I blame whoever puts him out there when he himself knows he can't play the position. See, they put him over at third, and he couldn't get the job done. Then, then they said, you couldn't play second, so go to third. Now you can't play third, go back to second. Boy, we're going to have a full house here. And what an outstanding promotion by this rock and roll station. You know, other teenage nights, that have dancing out in center field and hardly hardly anybody out there. But tonight, they filled this ballpark. All right, Bob Surratt, you're always talking about doing Cub games. <laughs> you better look back over your shoulder, pal, because if this reflects audience, these guys must have a far bigger audience than WLS. They have actually filled the ballpark on their promotion. Here's a pitch swing on and miss. What do you expect from a guy that wants to do Cub games? <laughs> nah, I mean, he'd have had an audience if his ambition was to do White Sox games. One strike and nothing, runners at first and third, first game of the doubleheader, 
three to one in favor of the Tiger. Parrish, long ball hitter, bouncing ball foul. Two strikes and nothing. Well, you know, the way Bannister can hit, Harry, if he can get him somewhere where he can be relaxed, where he knows he can play, he'll no tell how good a hitter he's going to be. But this way here, when you're out there and you know you've got to struggle on every play, it isn't easy for him. He gives you his best effort, but it's not easy. Two strikes and nothing. <laughs> the pitch. He tapped it foul. Listen to the crowd. I can't make out what they're chanting. Oh, I can't, but I won't tell you. Because it's bad for your ears. Nice elderly gentleman like you at the senior citizen. Why don't you, why don't you let me have that letter from my grandmother? <laughs> I'm kidding, Dutchie. Just joking. I heard Dutchie. She just said, give it to him. <laughs> Two strikes and nothing. She's got pretty handwriting on pink paper. There goes a run on first. Stock him out. Parrish goes down swinging. One run. Two hits. No air charged. Two left. He's walked. Two men and both of them scored. We go to the bottom of the third to two. Harry Carey back in the ballpark. The White Sox are trailing three to one. Alan Bannister opened with a double and was stranded in the first inning. Boy, it looks like our team needs a Texas uniform to bring them to life. We really look flat so far tonight. We're swinging the bats pretty good off of this guy. We've gotten three hits, hit the ball hard. In fact, we've hit four balls. One was a line shot off the bat of Lemon. Alan Bannister going for his 100th hit of the season. Pat Under with the little left hand. It was one three, lost none. A perfect record. Last ball in there. Underwood was born and raised in Kokomo, Indiana. There's a smash foul outside third. Hey, what's the story with uh, Mark Fidrich? I saw him on the field, but I didn't have a chance to talk to him. They put him on the disabled list, and he just hasn't pitched in about a month and maybe five weeks. There's a pitch swung on, fly ball, easy out, left field. Waiting for it, Morales, and he has. One away. I understand the uh, the Tigers were trying to get Fidridge waived so they could send him down to the minor league, so they could send him down to Florida. But one of the teams, I think it was the White Sox, claimed him, so they recalled him from the uh, waiver list. Why would you want to do that? Why would you want to claim a guy who hasn't pitched well for three years? Well, just on a chance you might be able to come up with him. One ball, no strikes. Junior Moore. You never know, sometimes you get lucky, I guess. Smash to the third baseman, picks it up, fire. Into the dirt, but Jason Thompson comes up with it. Well, that kid's no Rodriguez, I'll tell you that. He did stop that ball. How tall is he? He looks like he's about five feet nine. Or... He's about five ten. Got a good bat. He's hitting 500 since he came up from the minor leagues. I wish we could get a hold of Rodriguez. Two men are out. Nobody on. Chet Lemon, the batter. He shortened up the bunt. The off-speed pitch was in there for a strike call. One strike and nothing. Two men are gone. We're in the third. ballpark has gone and we might have we're going to have at least 40,000 he bunts it goes foul he's in the hole strike two 
Pretty good play by Lemon. If he gets on there, it gives Lamar Johnson a chance to tie it up. Harry, you notice the grass line right along third base on the inside part of the infield? It's so high that if you bunt the ball and it hits on the edge there, it just goes foul. Well, I would talk those groundkeepers if I was a bunter to try and level that off a little bit so it'd be flat. Top clock 83 from Plainfield on hand tonight. Two strikes and nothing. Fastball inside. Well, he's got pretty good stuff. He reached back and hummed that pitch. Lemon hitting way up in front of the plate. It's kind of hard to get by with a change up to him. See his stance. He's way up in front of that plate. Bouncing ball. The third baseman cuts it off. Fires perfectly for the out. One, two, three is Lemon dived head first but was out. You youngsters watching that, don't do that. You'll break your shoulder, break your arm, break everything. That is one of the plays that you don't ever want to do. You lose a stride before you gain it on that play. All right. This is Harry Carey with Jimmy Pearsall. We're going to go over to the radio booth for a while. The score here at the end of three, the Tigers three, the White Sox one. Hi again, everybody. Lauren Brown back at... Comiskey Park as we go to the fourth the Tigers have scored in each of the first three innings here and lead three to one Morrison throws out Brookins as he goes after the first pitch here and there's one out two of the Detroit runs got on by walks and the other got on by an air Brookins had tripled in one of the runs his first time up so Allen traveled the batter. Despite the fact a right-hander is going tonight, the Tigers with five right-handed hitters in their lineup. Tigers got an unearned run in the first, one in the second, and scored a run in the last inning as Pryor goes to his left. Nice play, real smooth. Worth looking at again. Boy, you're an old smoothie. Watch this. It's so effortless. Spins around and throws him out. Not even close. Two up and two down. Howard trying to retire the side in order for the first time tonight. Ron LaFleur, the batter, shortened up as if to bunt and takes a strike. LaFleur 0 for 2 this evening. Both times he has pulled the ball to the third baseman. That's high. Big crowd on hand tonight. Teen night. All teenagers admitted for half price. That's the ball. LaFleur. Hitting 296 coming into the doubleheader. Fly ball to right. Rusty Torres is there and an easy 1-2-3 inning. For Howard, did not throw many pitches. And we go to the bottom of the fourth. Detroit three, the White Sox one. Lauren Brown back at Comiskey Park as we go to the bottom of the fourth. It'll be Johnson, Nordhagen, and Torres. The White Sox have loaded their lineup with right-handed hitters here tonight. Against Underwood, not a left-hander in the group. The only one that close to it is Torres, a switch hitter. They're loaded out in the bleachers in center field. Not much room left out there to sit. Rapidly filling up in the upper and lower decks and right and left. Lamar Johnson leads it off. This plays really a buzz tonight on disco, anti-disco demolition night. Lamar flied out to center, hit a shot to LaFleur, takes a strike. Pat Underwood, a Kokomo, Indiana boy. Boy, the fortunes of he and his brother are just at the opposite ends of the spectrum. His brother, Tom, lost nine in a row this year before shutting out Oakland. In fact, he even lost to Pat, one to nothing. And 
Pat had lost 15 in a row over the last two years, but young Pat here, 22 years old, has come up from Evansville and won three in a row. One strike in the batter. Underwood has given up three hits. All three should have been doubles. But for some reason, Rusty Torres stopped at first when he hit a ball into the left field corner. Said that he, they thought maybe he had missed first and had to go back. Here's the two-strike pitch. Swing and a miss on a breaking ball. Struck him out. Second strikeout for Underwood since Pryor doubled home the lone White Sox run. Underwood now is retired five in a row. Nordhagen the batter. Nordy old for his last eight has not had a hit since he hit a home run in Kansas City. White Sox fallen behind now in their last three ball games. And back to win the previous two against Texas hoping to do the same here tonight in game one against Detroit. Fly ball to left. Morales going back. And he has a play right at the base of the picnic area. And there's two out. Just got underneath that ball a little too much. Why right, Bannister hit one to the warning track. He just underneath a little too much. The uppercutted it. trouble with the fans out in center field continually hanging a banner out which affects the hitters background as they remove it now Rusty Torres with a single tonight nobody on and two out takes a strike Steve Kemp was taken to Illinois Masonic Hospital for precautionary x-rays after being hit over the eye with a ball that ricocheted off the wall in batting practice. So the Tiger representative to the All-Star game not in the lineup here tonight as Torres misses strike two. tonight they did not score in the first going with Moose Haas lazy fly ball to left center field and that retires the side the White Sox retired one two three for the second straight inning seven in a row now retired by Underwood as we're through four innings of play Detroit three the White Sox one Lauren Brown back at Comiskey Park as we move on to the fifth inning. That ball game up at Toronto tonight. Milwaukee going against Toronto. Pat Underwood, who is pitching here for the Tigers. His brother Tom is pitching for Toronto tonight with a 3-11 record going against Moose Haas. San Francisco at Montreal just underway. Count Montefusco going against Rogers. The count one at four, Rogers nine and five. And San Diego is at Philadelphia, Shirley four and nine. Going against Carlton, 10 and 9. Here the Tigers lead 3 to 1. Lou Whitaker leads it off. 0 for 1 officially. He walked and scored in the first, takes his strike. Fred Howard on the mound has not done a bad job. Conceivably, this could be a 1 to 1 tie now. An error in the first and an error in the second helped the Tigers score a couple. Fouled out of play. He's in the hole 0 and 2. Later tonight, Texas will be at Kansas City. Rangers just left town after the White Sox swept them in three games. Kansas City has lost four in a row and the 11 out of 12 as you take a look at Sparky Anderson in American League uniform. His first appearance in Chicago as an American League manager. That's a ball inside. 
Sparky had great success with Cincinnati. Won the World Series back in 75. Probably one of the greatest World Series in the history of baseball. And Cincinnati won it in seven games against the Red Sox. It's one of the few World Series the National League has won lately. Anderson. A winning percentage as a manager as Whitaker fouls it off of 617. That is the highest in the history of baseball with the exception of Joe McCarthy. Only Joe McCarthy had a better win, one loss percentage as a manager than Sparky Anderson. That's a ball. However, Sparky's Tigers have lost 18 out of 30 since he took over. Two to the count. Up the middle, Pryor has it in the dirt, and he got it. Or was that in the dirt? Looked like it from up here. That ball looked like it might get through straight up the middle, but Pryor to his left makes his patented pirouette and got him just shoelace high. So there's one out. Rusty Staub has been on twice tonight. A single and a walk. He has stolen a base and he has scored a run. St. Bernardine's team club from Oak Park is here tonight. 1-0 pitch. Fouled off. Well, the two second place clubs in the National League go at it tonight. The Cubs in Cincinnati. Cubs trailing Montreal by four and a half games. Cincinnati five and a half back of Houston. Los Angeles at New York tonight. Hooten going against Ellis. Strike two. Hooten seven and six. Ellis 0 oh and two. Those are the two last place clubs in the National League. Dodgers 16 and a half back. The Mets 15 and a half back. the seats in fact the Mets have played better ball than the Dodgers a winning percentage of 407 the Dodgers at 404 strikeout for Howard and the batter Jason Thompson he is struck out and he is flight out to right pops it foul onto the roof Don Kessinger and Bobby Winkles and Joe Sparks the brain trust of the White Sox Herman Schneider and man in the white, White Sox trainer. High of all. Lorelei is upstairs, so we'll be having her on shortly. Representing WLUP FM. Here's the 1 1 delivery. That's a strike. Milwaukee, Toronto scoreless at the end of one. Cubs are just getting underway at Cincinnati. Cubs going with Holtzman tonight. He went around. The umpire at third said, yes, he did. Struck him out. Three up and three down for the second straight inning. Seven in a row retired by Howard. We go to the bottom of the fifth. Three to one. Tigers out in front. Lorelei, who has 
taken Chicago by storm the last few months with her uh, television commercials for WLUP and everything else. And you'll see her on camera here in just a second. How do you like Chicago, dear? Yeah, I love it. It's terrific. What do you think of this crowd? And there's a lot of, a lot of people here. <laughs> Listen, I told my boys who are 16 and 14, I got to give you a kiss. Ah, it's good to see you. You do great. And listen, I hope that it really catapults your career. Thank I you. think it will. Thank you. Okay, Laurel, I thank you very much. You. So we go to the bottom of the fifth here. Three to one. Morrison leads it off, and Mitch Michaels is here from WLUP and is going to do a little play-by-play. -play. So, Mitch, take it away. Jim Morrison, the batter. All right. Thank you, Lauren. Uh, a great night for a ball game and uh, a great night for a disco destruction, I might say. Really? Well, she's Incredible. a stunner, isn't she? There's a lot of folks outside, and there's still room, so we'd like to see anybody come down, and they want to. A hot and smoky one. Three to one, the Tigers are leading. That's ball two. Two balls and two strikes on Morrison. Leading off in the fifth. We're going to get some runs for the Sox. Got two. That's it. Left-hander delivers. Oh, in the Oh! Said he went around on it. Struck him out. That's the third strikeout for Underwood. And here is Mr. Pryor. Greg has accounted for our only run tonight with a double. That was back in the second inning. Uh, I was still on the radio at that point. Good. So he's one for one tonight, huh? Underwood pitches a strike. This has to be one of the better radio station promotions I've ever seen. A ball outside. I'll tell you something. It's, it's very interesting. This thing has really uh, ballooned very rapidly. And uh, it's just a Steve Dahl's anti-disco army. And they're here in force tonight. Swing and a miss. Strike two. A little high and outside, but he went for it. The count is one and two. One out. Sacks down three to one. Tigers. Pretty strong performance from Underwood tonight so far. It's a drive to left center. The floor is Aaron Hansen. All right. The batter is Colburn, who rounded out 6-3, right? Third to first? Right. All Short right. to first. Short to first, right. I'm sorry. You were on this afternoon, weren't you? Yeah, I was. What's your uh, normal two, airship? Two to six in the afternoon. Yeah, I heard you coming in, as a matter of fact. Did you get a chance to go to the press party this afternoon? Meet no, Lauren because of, I would have liked to. Swung on it. It was a drive to right center. But it's going to be caught. And that ends the inning. This kid is tough. He's now retired ten in a row as we go to the sixth inning. Detroit three, the White Sox one. Center field. Right field, left field. Right there. Lauren Brown back at Comiskey Park with Mitch Michaels from WLUPFM as we go to the sixth. And Mitch is going to do another half inning here as the Tigers come to bat. They'll have Summers, Morales, and Parrish as they lead it by a score of 3-1. to one. And we'll see if Fred Howard can hold him this inning and uh, get this knocks back up and get some runs here. 3-1, to one, a hot and sticky night in Chicago and a great night for a ball game. Twilight doubleheader. This is the second game and lots of time for you all to come out and, uh, and see the White Sox. Exciting baseball out here. Summers, a left-hand hitter. Flew to left, and I think he doubled. Well, single. I wasn't here when the, uh, the game started. I was still on the radio, so we'll see if Fred Howard can do something for him. Summers stands in. And here's the pitch. Ball outside. As I came in tonight, there were a lot of folks still outside with their disco records waiting to get in, but I still think you could probably get down here and uh, check out the game. It's ball two. Again, a little outside. Playing 
Summers pretty much straight away. Here's the pitch. Swing and a foul tip. Fred Howard one and three this year. Two balls and a strike. Swung and fouled again. Summers goes into the dirt himself. Big cut. So that evens it at two and two. Top of the six, White Sox down three to one. Went for a low inside, low inside pitch that time and uh, turned himself around. He'd have been a corkscrew to go right into the ground. Two and two. Summers is ready and here's the pitch. It's a line single right field. Solid shot. No question about it. That's his second hit, Mitch, and that stops a string of seven in a row retired by Howard. We'll see if we can get a double play ball on this one. It's Jerry Morales. Familiar name to uh, Chicago baseball fans. He played some, uh, some pretty good center field and some pretty good outfield for the Cubs over the years. Good hitter. He's found a home in Detroit after traveling to St. Louis. This is the second year with Detroit, isn't it? No, this is the first year. Oh, okay, that's right. Last year he was with St. Louis, I forget. There goes the runner. Threw it out of second base, but he's in there. Throw the Tigers in and stealing. Yeah. That's their third stolen base. Throw was a little to the left of the base. And let's take a look at it again. There he goes. The pitch is a strike. That's the second time that a runner has gone in the first pitch. Morales had done it earlier tonight. Now activity in the bullpen. A left-hander and a right-hander down there throwing. Morrison holds the runner on at second and throws him out. All right. So one out and perish the batter. Guy Hoffman and Ed Farmer in the bullpen. Farmer's had a couple of good outings in the past uh, couple of nights against Texas. Looked real good in relief. Yes, he did. Saved one game, and uh, although he didn't get a save in the first one that he pitched in, uh, got the big out at the end of the game and uh, kept that sock streak alive. Here's Parrish. What did he do last time? Parrish is fly out and struck out tonight. tossed out of the field. I would hope they would wait to between games I would hope before so that. Too, yeah. I mean, uh, everybody's here to have a good time, but there's no reason to disrupt the ball game. There goes another one. Where there's one clown, there's always another. Some fan told a youngster, he said, next time you're going over. I think people realize that the danger of throwing things out of on a playing field like that, too. The danger of the athletes out there. All right. Here's the pitch. Oh, it's in there for a strike. even on the breaking balls and if you hear an announcer say breaking ball he's he's being correct but oftentimes he doesn't know whether it's a there goes the runner the runner ground ball base hit in the left center the 
Tigers get another run. It makes it four to one. And the activity continues in the White Sox bullpen. Oftentimes, Mitch, you don't know whether it's a slider or a curveball, but you could tell pretty much how the batter reacts. That's one of the things as Kessinger comes to the mound. So we might have a change here. Detroit out in front, four to one. They've scored in all but the fourth inning. Now he's calling for the right hander. Looks like Ed Farmer will be. In. So the move is made. Howard is out of the ball game. And Ed Farmer comes on, and we'll be back right after this message. Horn Brown back with Mitch Michaels as we're in the sixth. And uh, correction on that, Detroit has scored in every inning but the fourth and fifth. And Howard had retired seven in a row, but a pair of singles with a stolen base here has scored another run. So Howard went five in the third innings, allowed four runs, only two of them earned on six hits, walked two, struck out four. And the runner on first is his responsibility. Ed Farmer comes into the ball game. Farmer has won two, he's lost three, he saved the ball game in his last outing, and has an earned run average of 5.29, and the first man that he will face will be Tom Brookins. All right, Farmer's looked good in the last couple of outings. Like you said, Lauren, he had a save the, the last time out, and uh, the night before that against Texas looked pretty good, too. So we'll see if we can stem the tide here and uh, plug, up the, uh, plug up the Tigers a little bit. Runner on first with one out. Brookins, the right-hand batter. Throw over to first base. Just to keep him honest, I think. And here's Farmer's first pitch. Strike over the outside corner. Now, was that a fastball? I really wasn't looking at the pitch. I was looking out uh, in the bullpen when he threw it. Looked like it was, though. I mean, just the sound of the mitt up here. Yeah. I just saw the last part of the pitch. Right back to Farmer. Looks like it could be the double play ball we were looking for, and that is it. All right, one six three in the double play. That is the inning. All right, Mitch, thank you much. Hopefully right, we'll get you. some more. Appreciate it. Right, Have a good time between games. Mitch Michaels here helping us out in the six. Tigers with one run on two hits. No errors, nobody left on. We go to the bottom of the six. Detroit four, the White Sox one. Cool not to. Lauren Brown back at Comiskey Park as we go to the bottom of the six. Tigers leading four to one. White Sox try to get back into it here against Pat Underwood, who has been tough. He has retired 11 in a row since Pryor doubled home Torres in the second inning. It'll be the top of the order, Bannister, Moore, and Lemon. Richard Boone locks himself and a condemned man in jail for protection on Half Gun Will Travel. Saturday at 4.30 here on Channel 44. Mayberry is at a home run for Toronto. His 15th of the year with nobody on in the second. Bannister a double in two trips tonight leads it off. Tonight disco demolition with some of the fans getting a little antsy throwing these disco records out. Records. I can't tell whether they're disco or rock or lullabies, but at any rate, they're throwing records out on the field. Slowing up the entire process here as Bannister takes a strike. This is the first game of a doubleheader. Tigers have been very successful in doubleheaders this year. They've swept two. Well, I can't say very successful. Banny fouls it off, and they've been swept three times. White Sox have not won a doubleheader. They've been swept twice. And they have split a twin bill.
Lost a twin bill to California, to Minnesota, and split a twin bill at Texas. Time is called. Underwood, 22 years old, six-footer, 175-pounder. I would imagine his folks from Kokomo are up here watching him tonight. They were guests of the Toronto Ball Club when he went to Toronto and pitched against his brother and beat him one to nothing in his Major League debut. Bob Finnegan advising the crowd to refrain from throwing records out will be ejected and the huge majority applauds that decision. This rule has no other purpose but the safety of everyone in this ballpark. The White Sox and all of us are very glad to have everybody here. Please don't destroy the fun of the evening for people or cause injury and get yourself arrested and taken from the park. Please don't do that. Thank you. So we're set for action. Two strikes on Bannister. Ground ball to short. Trammell has it and throws him out. Twelve in a row retired by Underwood. And Junior Moore, the batter, 0 for 2 tonight. Tigers with an unearned run in the first and an unearned run in the second. To lead 2 to nothing. Then the Sox got a run in the bottom of the second. Then Detroit is another run in the third and one in the top half of this inning. That's a strike. Some of our restaurant row members tonight include Ember's Restaurant, R.J. Kirkpatrick, the owner. Shortstop throws him out. Nice play. Two out. Wonder in with Larry and Hank Klein. Stumps Pub, Don Stump, the owner. Phil Schmidt and Son Restaurant out in Whiting. Michael Probst. Let us entertain you in the Pump Room group. Rich Melvin, Choir Boys Tap with James Schmidt, and Faces, Jim Rittenberg. Those are our restaurant row folks here in game one. I'd say well over 30,000 here tonight. Chet 0 for 2. He is lined out and grounded out. strikes to Chet. That's a strike. Pryor doubled a man home. Torres in the second with two out. Then Colburn grounded out. And since then, Underwood has retired the side in order three straight innings and now has nobody on him two out here in the sixth. That snaps the string. Trammell making a fine effort. Twelve straight retired. But Chet takes this 2-1 pitch. Looks like a fastball. Just out of the reach of Alan Trammell. Well, Lamar, a little overdue. A hit last night, but he's got three in the homestand, and I mean overdue, overdue for the long one. Foul to the right side. Toronto leading Milwaukee two to nothing at the end of two. Montreal has jumped out in front of the Giants, one to nothing. 
at the end of two and the Dodgers did not score in the first at New York. Holtzman and the Cubs at Cincinnati just underway as the pitch is low. Cubs had their five game winning streak snap last night but did not lose any ground in Montreal as the Expos were getting beat. Cincinnati going with Moscow in that game. 2-1 pitch. That's the ball. 3-1. Wayne Nordhagen in the on-deck circle. Holtzman 6-6 six six this year. Moscow 5-3. 3-1 one pitch. Ball four. Tying run comes to the plate. Nordhagen drove Morales back to the picnic area wall out the left his last time up. He's got underneath it a little too much. Nordy without a hit in his last nine times up. Now the time for the long one. Four to one Detroit leading. The tying runs on base. We're going to get activity in the Tiger bullpen. That's a strike. Looks like a really old Lopez. Here he is. Aurelio Lopez, who has really pitched well of late for the Tigers. That's the ball, one and one. Broken bat grounder to the third baseman makes the force out at third, and that retires the side. No runs. One hit and two men left on. We're through six innings of play. I'm Lauren Brown. Harry Carey will be along in a minute. It's Detroit four, the White Sox one. We go to the top of the seventh. Trailing four to one. Got to hold him to have a chance. Young Pat Underwood, just 22 years old, has been outstanding. He's held the White Sox to only four hits. Here's their shortstop, Alan Trammell, leading it off. This is disco demolition night. The insane coho lips night. They're an anti-disco army headed by Steve Dahl of WLUP Radio, FM 98, which is a, a rock station. Well, I think it's the best, without a question, the greatest teenage promotion night that any station has had by far. They've got this ballpark absolutely jammed. People in the aisles trying to locate seats. Mike Torchia will give me an idea how jammed these aisles are. Trammell hits a fly ball to center. That'll be an easy out. Lemon is there and he takes it. Run away. Let's see if we can pick up the traffic jam in the aisle. That's the story right now. Look at the people. They're looking for their seats. That's how crowded it is. Here now is round the floor. Ed Farmer came in in relief and got a double play to end the six. There's a fastball outside. Well, the last couple of nights, 
our seventh inning has turned the ball game around. Maybe we'll do it again tonight. Two strikes on the ball. Bounces in front of the plate. One of Chicago's best rock and rollers, Jack Gone of Portable Tools, <laughs> wandering around, drinking a coal winner, 18. Two balls, two strikes. Well, three low. The pitch lined in the right field for a hit. LaFleur singles to right. There's Sweet Lou Whitaker, their second baseman. Boy, they came up with a shortstop, second base combination. Last year. They won't be 22 until the end of the season. Trammell at short, Whitaker at second. And they can do it all. Great arms, fast, good fielders, good hitters. There you see Lou Whitaker. One out, one on. stealing on Colburn. He is just taking too long to release the ball. Now watch it. See the jump isn't that much. Look at the pitch out. Now look how long it took him. He saw it took aim before he threw. You can't do that with a LaFleur. Dick Davis just hit a homer with two on for Milwaukee. They've taken the lead at Toronto three to two. There's a strike. Two strikes in the ball, one out on the floor. Just swiped his 46th base of the year. He's on the American League All-Star team. He held up in time. Two balls, two strikes. Four to one, Detroit. Ed Farmer scares him back. The pit. Right to the shortstop. Fryer holds the runner at second, throws to first. Two gone. Here's Rusty Stop. Veteran outfielder is the designated hitter tonight. He has scored a run. He has walked. He got a base hit. And he struck out. Four to one, Detroit. Line foul. Gates Brown, the first base coach, takes a dive to get out of the way. Stahl broke in with Houston in 1963. So he's been around 17 years. He got a $100,000 bonus to sign originally as a 17-year-old kid out of New Orleans. That was back in 1962. 
just to destroy them because it's disco music. The FM station, Loop, WWP, is a rock and roller and they don't like disco. <laughs> Boy, I can't get over these aisles, how jammed they are. Even upstairs, there must not be any seats left. Tories will try to get us started. A hot, muggy night in Chicago. Underwood's first pitch in there a beauty. This kid from Evansville, Indiana. Actually, 
Born and raised in Kokomo, Indiana, but he pitched at Evansville. One strike to nothing. The pitch on the way. High pump foul back. Into the stands, a souvenir. Underwood was at Evansville last year where he won five, lost five, with a higher and run average. Two strikes and nothing. Fastball a little bit low. Two strikes on the ball. High lazy fly ball should be caught. And Champ Summers grabs it. One away is Jim Morrison, the third baseman. He has fanned twice against Underwood. only one man. Bouncing ball. Nice play by Brookins. Easy out. Morrison with three and one was swinging and bounced out. Two up, two down. Here's Pryor who doubled in the only run we have. The Lombard American Legion team here tonight. Good fastball right in. Boy, this kid changes speeds. Has good control of everything. See, he let up off this fastball that time. Funny thing is, minor league record has never been so impressive. He won five, lost five last year. Popped it up. The catcher Parrish is there. Easy out. One, two, three, nothing across. At the end of seven, Detroit four, the White Sox one. Harry Carey back in the ballpark. Oh, it's going to be a wild scene out there in the center field bleachers. I'm on the board, they say. Farewell and good luck, Brian Hewitt. Brian Hewitt, the fine young sports writer of the Chicago Sun-Times. Apparently will switch assignments after the All-Star break. Picking up the Cubs for the second half after covering the White Sox for the first half. As is the custom of that of the newspapers. I think Holtzman will join us. Holtzman. Jason Thompson is going to lead it off. Ed Farmer has done a great job in relief. Throws a fastball under a beauty. 
He's pitched six scoreless innings in relief his last six innings. He's been outstanding. Each of those victories over the Rangers. Curveball low. A ball and a strike. It'll be Ken Craven going for the White Sox in the second game. Good slider over the inside corner. Two strikes in the ball. Nobody on, nobody on. Jimmy will have Bill Gleason for some time. Popular sports columnist. At halftime. Between games. <laughs> Got the wrong sport. Curve inside. Two balls, two strikes. The delivery struck him out swinging. Three ties for Thompson tonight. He's just not having a good year for him. There's Champ Summers, who is. He's two out of three tonight. He worked on that knotless all winner, and they tell me that he doesn't even move around the bag as good as he used to. He's got himself a little bit too muscle bound. So you got to know what you're doing when you get involved with it. Now, knotless. One out, nobody on. Curveball a little bit low, ball one. First game of the doubleheader, we're in the top of the eighth. How'd you build up your shoulders, Harry? I built mine up with unloading freight cars for a silver factory. <laughs> <laughs> You're going to say something, I know. <laughs> Doing push-ups. Oh. Two balls, no strikes. I don't know how much attention they're playing to the ball game out there in center field, but they seem to be having a lot of fun, whatever they're doing. They had three quarters of these people here tonight that have never been in this park before. They're looking for where the pigeons sit. They're looking for Harry. <laughs> One out, nobody on. Ball four, he walked him. Summers has been on base three times in a row after he lined hard to left in the first. He singled to set up their second run. And he singled and later scored their fourth run. Now he has walked with one out. One on, one out. Boy, I wish I'd have thought about it. Tonight would have been a great time to be broadcasting out of the Centerville bleachers. I would have never saw you again. It would have been the last time I've ever seen you. <laughs> <laughs> You'd have coughed your way home. Well, the only thing about it, they... They smoke too many cigarettes out there, those guys. <laughs> I said that you cough your way home. In fact, I can't see out there right now. There's a throw to first and run back. Look at them in the aisles, Harry. Look at them. You keep talking before. Look at them. They can't find seats, seats all over. You know what they do? I guess they get in for 98 cents and a broken record or something. Is that how it works? Yeah. What What is Detroit share? Do they get 20% out of the 98 cents? I don't know. <laughs> or do they get the 28% of the broken record? Runner at first, one out. Smoke, smoke, smoke that cigarette. Well, there are a lot of guys stoned out here tonight. <laughs> I don't know whether it's the beer or what they're doing. There's a ground ball hit for right field. Lannister can't reach it. A man going to third. I'll Morales you, gets his third hit. I'll tell you one thing. Benny guards second base so well that if all you do is just throw it, you can throw it through there. He, he, that ball wasn't even hit good at all if you see in a replay. He just hit it off the end of the bat. you, you got to cut that in half. Watch this now. Watch. It's just a little slow roll. Look at it bouncing. Bow, 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 beep, beep. But that's okay, Harry. We'll get him. Runners in first and third. Boy, look at Farmer. He's not too happy with that either. He, Farmer's the type of guy that when he makes a good pitch, he don't like to see something get a base hit for it. 
I wish you could have watched Bobby Richardson. You've seen many great second baseman. Right? Look at Farmer walking out. He is angry. Oh, yeah, he's not happy about that. I see those balls have got to be caught. Let's let's face it. When they wake up around here and play players where they belong and stop looking for that miracle again, you know, it's not gonna happen. You know, Kessinger's got to play right now. If, you know, he, he plays second or short wherever he wants to play. And let Banny maybe play left field or somewhere. Now Farmer's walking out again. Well, I'll tell you. Oh boy, look at that one just missed Gates. That that one just missed Gates. Boy, that's very dangerous. That lot will have to call that second game if they keep that up. They're throwing out these records now. Should make some more announcements. Look at them way out there, big ones. Boy, and, and Torrey's put his hand on his head. Runners at first and third, one out. Infield back, hoping for the double play. Strike on the outside corner. One strike or nothing. Scarberry warming up in the bullpen for the White Sox. Four to one, Detroit. There goes the runner. Fouled out of play. <laughs> They're going to run this. Up. Hey, great cut. By a fan stripped of the waist. Sitting in the upper deck. Tell you one thing we're seeing under Sparky Anderson. They're doing a lot more running than we ever saw him do before. Right. That's his kind of baseball. Well, see, Parrish strikes out a lot, so he wants them to just hit the ball somewhere. Then they'll get the run and no double play. That's smart baseball. Two strikes and nothing. <laughs> there goes a runner lined. Double play. It's going to be right to Pryor to retire the side. Parrish lined to Pryor for a double play. With Morales going on the pitch, and all Pryor had to do is throw the ball over to Lamar Johnson. No runs, one hit, no errors, one left. We go to the bottom of the eighth. Harry Carey back at the ballpark. We're going to the bottom of the eighth. The Tigers are leading four to one. John Ellis just hit his ninth home of the year in the first inning with a man on at Kansas City. So the Royals are still reeling. Colburn's going to lead it. Lead it off here. Steve Kemp, who was hit over the eye in practice, was taken to Illinois Masonic Hospital for x-rays, which proved negative, and the doctors released him for playing. Soon as he recovers from the dizziness that he was feeling. Milwaukee leading at Toronto, three to two in the fifth. The New York Mets got eight runs in the first inning against the Dodgers. There's a curveball in there, a strike call. Nobody on and nobody out. You don't know, have a lot of people here. Now all to the shortstop, trammels throw, easy out. You're really happy to see him, you know, but when you look out there as a player and they start throwing things, boy, it, it makes you say, I wish you stayed home because you hurt somebody. Fourteen of the 22 outs have either been strikeouts or on the infield. Not so much in command, Pat Underwood has been.
Here's Bannister, the pitch he swings of old time. Third baseman fires. Two up, two down. Underwood looks like he could pitch the second game with a doubleheader just as well. He hasn't even got his outfit wet. Remember yesterday, everybody was sweating and perspiring. Tonight, it's a pretty nice night, and he is not overheated. He hasn't had to throw too many pitches. I'll bet you he hasn't thrown over 104 or five pitches. Milt Wilcox, a right-hander, will pitch the second game against Ken Craven. There's the pitch, a little bit low and outside to Junior Moore. Moore is nothing out of three. Bottom of the eighth, four to one. There's a drive and a deep left field, way back, way back. It is up against the wall, extra bases. Moore on his way to second base with a double. Moore doubled to the left center field wall. And that brings up Chet Lemon now. Activity in the bullpen. Lopez. Here you'll see a high breaking ball now, and he just rips it. He got it all. Morales gives it a good try, but it's over his head. It bounces up against the wall, and Moore goes in a second. Easy with a double. Maybe we got something going here. Let's go, Chet. Coming out. Julio Morales gave that ball a long run, but couldn't reach it. Here's Lemon. He's one out of three. Hit the ball sharply every time. Out of pitch. Started the swing and he held up. One ball, no strikes. Two men are out. Ball game in the eighth. There you see Lopez has been doing a great job in the bullpen. The catcher just refused to catch anymore. He almost got hit with a firecracker, Harry. It went right over his head and he just refused not to get on there anymore. One ball, no strikes. Here's the pitch, swung on and fouled out of play. And the count is evened up at a ball and a strike. It ceases to be funny when someone might get hurt permanently. I'll tell you I one just thing. just wonder, I see empty seats around. But I also see the aisles jam with spectators. Well, they don't know where they're going. They've never been in the ballpark in their life. A ball and a strike. What I'm uh, worried about, what's going to happen between games of a doubleheader when there's no action on the field at all, but uh, what the station doing, uh, whose promotion it is, will be entertaining between games. Well, I'll tell you one thing. This Mark get... Anderson just came out and said something to Dave Phillips, the plate umpire. See what happens too, Harry, if a fly ball goes to the outfield and somebody throws something. All that outfielder has to do is make out it come at him when he wasn't even going to catch it. It's an out. But they don't hear us, and they're having a ball, and they're in another world right now. The world of no Junior return. Junior Moore in scoring position, two out. Chad Lemon waiting. Lamar Johnson is next. Chad, let's go. The birds are starting to look like records. A ball and a strike. Curve ball low. Manny Trio hit a home run to man on for the Phillies to tie up. San Diego 2-2. Texas got three in the first at Kansas City. Two balls and a strike. The pitch here it is. Curve ball low. Does that kiss feel familiar? Hi, Dutchie. Dutchie, you stay right up here. I don't want you to get down there. The world is different. Here's the pitch. Strike call. Now the count is full. Three balls, two strikes. We're in the bottom of the eighth. Detroit leading four to one. What a night Dutchie come to come out. What'd you do, forget your glasses or something? Yeah, my bright glasses. 3-2 pitch. The Hedgewish Rockers are here. The pitch. Long drive foul into the right field corner. The count is full on Chet Lemon. Two out. A man in scoring position. We're in the eighth. 
Detroit leading in the first game of the doubleheader 4-1. A full count pitch. Ball four. The tying run will be at the plate. Maybe Lamar can get hold of one. Aurelio, Aurelio Lopez warming up. He's been pitching a lot for him lately, Lopez. Sparky Anderson coming out, and that's going to be all for Pat Underwood. We'll tell you about the new pitcher following this. Aurelio Pat Carey back in the ballpark. We have a new pitcher, Jimmy, a stocky right-hander who's been doing a great job for him. He's making his 27th appearance, and he's been working an awful lot lately. He's 4-2 with an ERA of 3.07. As Harry said, he's 6 feet tall. He says he's 6 200 pounds, but he's about 230. He's 30 years old from Mexico. Last year with Springfield, AAA, he was 6-6. Six and six. He went to the Cardinals where he was 4-2. Lopez has four saves, pitched 58 two-third innings. Given up 57 hits, 21 runs, 20 of them earned. They hit six home runs off him. He's allowed 24 base on balls. He struck out 45. He's sidearm, slider, turns it over, sinker. Not overpowering, but a live fastball in his sinker is awfully tough to hit if you try to pull it. So Lamar now with a chance to tie it up with two outs here in the bottom of the eight steps in. Tommy and George Gallio, sons of Jimmy, celebrating birthdays today. Lamar Johnson who could tie it up. He's been an easy out twice and walked. Fouled it off. Strike one. Dick Drazuski ducked for cover in the Tiger dugout. So did Brinkman. I'd like to see Orta hit right now, Coach. Or uh, Washington. Curve low. Well, maybe Lamar will do it. A ball and a strike. It's got to be the youngest crowd ever to fill up Comiskey Park. All rock and rollers. There goes a bouncing ball, easy force out. That retires the side. No runs, one hit, no errors. I guess we'll use the left-handed pinch hitters with the bases empty. At the end of eight, Detroit four, the White Sox one. the ballpark we're going in the top of the ninth it's four to one the White Sox had a shot that time but Sparky Anderson brought in his right-handed relief pitcher Aurelio Lopez the White Sox have had all the right-handed hitters in the lineup because Pat Underwood who pitched the first seven and two-thirds innings was a softball they went along with Lamar who unfortunately bounced out. Well, maybe they can still get something going in the night. Here we go with Tom Brookins. First pitch he hits down to Morris, a nice play. He's out. Boy, I hope we don't waste this beautiful job by Ed Farmer. Farmer's been outstanding. Came in and got a double play to end the sixth inning. So this will be three and two thirds innings of relief. He's allowed only two hits and no runs. One out, nobody on. We're in the ninth. Strike call to Alan Trammell. Trammell is nothing out of three. There's a fastball a little inside. A ball and a strike. The Mets are leading the Dodgers eight to nothing in the second. Liner right to Bannister. 
Two up, two down. Four to one, Detroit. Ken Krivik against Milt Wilcox in the second game. There'll be about a half hour between games. There's Ron LaFleur. He's one out of four, stole a base. He leads the American League with 46. Too low. Another night game tomorrow night. We'll be with you on Channel 44 as well as on WMAQ Radio at 7.15 tomorrow night and again Sunday night. And also at 1 o'clock, rather tomorrow night and Saturday night, and then at 1 o'clock Sunday afternoon, and then we'll have a three-day break for the All-Star game. Getting back in action in Texas following Thursday night. Line drive, right field, base hit. Watch how long it's going to take LaFleur to try to steal second. Farmer on the hill. Tigers trying to make it four out of five against the White Sox. There's Lou Whitaker. Another one of those records comes sailing out on the field. Well, there'll be no TV tomorrow night, I was just informed. Why is that on Friday? Friday night? So it'll be radio only tomorrow night. Schedule it says TV. Huh? Oh, the uh, they have a Friday night network game tomorrow night. There goes the floor. There's the pad. Easily safe. Number 47 for the floor. See, there he goes. Now the throw is high. The floor was, had already finished his slide. Giants have taken a two to one lead in Montreal. the catch to retire the side. No runs, one hit, no errors, one left to find. Relief job by Farmer. We go in the bottom of the ninth. Detroit four, White Sox one. Harry Carey back at the ballpark. Now with the bases empty here in the ninth inning, George Orta comes up to pinch hit. George Boy, there's a million banners here. You know, they could just keep from throwing those records on the field. It'd be just a tremendous promotion. Orta hitting 228. One ball, no strikes. Fastball right in there, strike off. Pump foul, going to be an easy out. The catcher's there, and he has. 
Parrish takes care of Ortiz. Pop foul. Cardell Washington. Here's Cardell Washington now, another pinch hitter. He too comes up with the bases loaded. Uh, empty rabbit. I wish they were loaded. Washington hitting 279, seven homers, 36 runs batted up. One away. Jonas Lopez has just only since Sparky Anderson took over has he been used in game situations. And he has done an outstanding job. He's won four, he's saved four, with an earned run average of 3.07. Swung, and he struck him out on three pitches. Hand hitters don't look any better than our right hand hitters. Right handers against the left hander are unproductive. Our left hand hitters against the right hander are unproductive. Here now is Jim Morrison. He's nothing out of three. Four to one in favor of the Tigers. First game of the doubleheader. Saturday night will be Irish night. Lopez throws a good screwball. He's 30 years old. A six footer, 200 pound. Strike on the outside corner. Foul it back. And the Tigers are now within one strike of a victory. Strikes on the ball. Two men are out. Low and outside. Texas leading Kansas City three to one in the second. The aisle still jammed. Apparently, fans that can't locate seats. Two two fifths. He struck him out, and the ball game is over. And the Detroit Tigers have made it four out of five. As they beat the Chicago White Sox in the first game of the doubleheader, four to one. Well, it was just something the Tigers haven't had most of the year. They had tonight. They had very effective pitching and fine defense and timely hitting. Fred Howard started. He pitched a creditable ball game. His defense was. Uh, a little shabby, or he would have been a lot closer in the game. The second game will pit Ken Kravick for the White Sox, a left-hander. Oh, how about that, a summer? Oh, gee, that's too bad. We had her waiting off in the wings, too. How about the Bee Gees? Oh, I see. Okay. Well, listen, we took all the disco records that you brought tonight. We got them in a giant box. And we're going to blow them up real good. Now, we will be returning to the scene of the crime here on the 5th of August for a day in the park with Journey and Santana, you know the whole boogie. And we'll blow up some more. Real good. Me and Teenage Radiation, so we'll see you here for that too, okay? Listen, a little snot nose here. A little snot nose, just a little snot nose. Ah, shucks, he's embarrassed. A little snot nose and I want to thank y'all for coming tonight, making us look clean like this. You know, we're pretty important now around the station. They might not even care if the news is late from now on. We appreciate you coming, but most of all, we appreciate you listening to us every morning. 
supporting us. And uh, hey, it's because of you that this is happening tonight, okay? Not because of us. We're merely a vehicle for your thoughts. Disco sucks. 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 Disco. Let's try a coho chant. Let's try a coho chant. Coho, 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 coho. The lovely Lorelei. Let's hear for the lovely Lorelei. The loop lady. Okay, listen. I'm gonna go blow up the records real good. And then if uh, things work out right here, we'll come back. Now we already had one national anthem tonight, but that's not the one we want to hear. We want to hear the insane Cool Hall Lips national anthem. What do you do you think on this call? Here's a little snap nose to give you the play-by-play -play on the blow up. Okay, let's usher Steve down to the Explosives with a loud Disco Sucks chant. Disco Sucks. 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 This go sucks. This go sucks. This go sucks. This go sucks. You know what I this go frenzy here. We'll be right back with an interview with Bill Gleason, the columnist, after this message. Disco sucks. Disco sucks. Disco sucks. Disco sucks. And we're never going to let them forget it. They're not going to shut it down our throats. We rock and rollers will resist, and we will triumph. All right, you ready? We're going to count to three, and then go boom. And they're going to pull up real good, I'm telling you, it's going to be high. One, two, three, boom! Here they go! Me and little snat nose. And we need to listen now, we need your help. We need your help with the national anthem. You gotta give us a, a you gotta give us a disco backbeat, okay? Now this is the only time I authorize you doing it, but it's for a good cause. The backbeat goes like this. Oh, he's got the music ready. Okay, well go ahead and roll the music then. And you can backbeat, it goes ooch, 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 ooch. That's a disco backbeat. Ah, yes. I can't hear the music too well, but what the hell. <laughs> I never know what I'm doing at the time anyway. I wear tight pants. I always stuff a sock in. 
it always makes the ladies start to talk it. My shirt is open. I never use the buttons. Though I look hip, I work for EF Hutton. Snot nose, do you, you think I'm disco? Cause I spent so much time blow drying out my hair. You like it? Do you think I'm disco? Cause I know the dance steps. Learn them all and try to stand. I know the dance steps, learned them all in Fred Astaire. Hey, where are you going? Well, you're going home. What, do you have to get up early and go to work tomorrow? What do you mean you don't have a job? Let me have your phone number. You don't have a phone? Let me have your address. I'll come by and visit you. What do you mean you don't have an address? What's going on around here? Some people call me scum. Because I don't have a realistic set of values. And I'm beginning to maybe think they're right. Oh, come on, now wait a second. I want to dance with you. I'm Tony, white three-piece suit. I'm happening. Come on. What's the deal here? I never meet any women at these places. And you're supposed to. It says so in all the magazines. I love to dance with girls in sleazy dresses, lipstick, nail charms, and makeup in excesses. Buy them a drink and try and get their number. Usually they are as cold as a cucumber. Do you think I'm disco? Am I superficial? Look and hips my only goal. Do you think I'm disco? Maybe it's not too late to get into rock and roll. Now, this disco thing isn't happening. That's a bummer, though. I spent all the, all that money on this suit, on this jewelry. And I've got the most expensive blow dryer on the market today. back in the ballpark and I'm sure glad and I hope they don't let you people see what's going on here at Comiskey Park. One of the saddest sights I've ever seen in a ballpark in my life. This garbage of demolishing a record has turned into a fiasco. My guest right now is Bill Gleason and Bill after all the years you've been in baseball I know you haven't ever seen anything like this. Nor has anyone else except after the uh, final game of a World Series in Shea Stadium. It seemed to me, Jimmy, that uh, the crowd on the field that we now have was uh, inevitable. I, just watching, you could sense that they were going to break out. And all of the kids in the lower deck who want to go out will be out there now. And the White Sox may have to forfeit the second game. You know, that's a shame, too. They do have about 50,000 people, it seems like, here. And to see what's going on in the field really is amazing and I don't know what they can do about it. I certainly hope they don't demolish the field like they did in New York because we've got quite a season to go yet and we're still in the race. Well, uh, the crowd doesn't seem to uh, have tearing up the turf in mind. I think somebody got away with, excuse me, Jim, with second base and I noticed one of the ushers salvaged first base. He pulled it up and ran into the dugout with it. But at the moment, Bill, can they call the game the second game, or will they forfeit it? <laughs> well, I don't know what the ruling would be. There, I would say there are 2,800 people on the field at the moment, Jim. So I don't know what they can possibly do. As you said, 
the baseball is no longer the story. It's this crowd. Yeah, you know we're over the ball. You know it's amazing. We got the greatest country in the world, but you know what? We have become followers. So many people insecure, don't know what to do with themselves and how to have a good time. They follow someone who's a jerk. Well, that's a situation here. A lot of followers and a lot of kids drinking down in the stands. There are a lot of happy kids out there. I, I don't mean happy in the modern sense, but uh, pleasant kids enjoying themselves, showing off a little bit. But uh, the thing you have to consider now, Jim, is whether they can keep this crowd in control. You know, they're trying to announce it over the loudspeaker, but nobody can hear over the loud. There are now, I'd say, 10,000 people on that field, Bill, without any question. Many are grouped around home plate, more around the mound, and they are just letting out all sorts of uh, enjoyment that I don't know what's so happy about that. I would rather swim, or I'd rather do a lot of other things than just stand on a baseball field. Well, I noticed uh, down in the Tigers' dugout some kids were trying to grab the bats, and Johnny McNamara, the clubhouse man, was protecting the bats by pounding on top of the bat rack with another bat. I know Johnny wasn't attempting to strike any of these kids and didn't. Look what's happened now. They got the, the batting cage. They're running it around the outfield. A very expensive piece of merchandise that the players need every night to have batting practice. It's a big one, and now they're jumping all around it. I don't know what can be done here, except maybe they're going to have to call in a lot of policemen or something because it's getting out of hand as far as things they're starting to do. I don't know how far they're going to go, but most of the people in the upper deck are staying here. They aren't leaving. It's mostly people from the center field bleachers and lower deck. Most of the people in the lower deck, Jim, too, have stayed in their seats. You look, uh, the majority of the crowd is still uh, seated or standing and watching this, but kids come off and others go back on, so it's uh, it's not a scene that I want to remember very long. No, not for in baseball, and I certainly hope that it's an ex there's an example being made here that something like this will never happen again, not only for this ballpark, but for all ballparks around the country. Uh, now they're calling for Harry, and I certainly know that <laughs> Harry will enjoy that, but I don't think he, too, would enjoy something like this going on. Well, I think it's the crowd in the stands. Uh, I think if they could hear, they ought to have the uh, disc jockey from uh, WLUP uh, get on and ask them, repeal to their sense of sportsmanship and ask them to go back to their seats. A lot of fans trying to get in the dugout here, the White Sox dugout, but they've got security guards around it. But it's, it's a long night. I don't think there's possibly be a chance to play. I said before that the only way I think they can stop this is along what Bill was saying. Some of these records are being thrown high in the air and they're going to strike people on top of the head and seriously cut somebody. And that's why I'm a little bit leery up here myself. Well, I think, uh, Jim, there's a definite pro probability of somebody being hurt because uh, there may be more than records flying. Kids are running around. I don't see how the security guards really can do anything but apprehend a kid or two and uh, take them out. They're trying to rescue the uh, batting cage now out in short center. But security guards are going to have a very tough time trying to handle this many people. You know, they seem to be getting tired a little bit of this, what they're doing, and some of them are walking off. But then you see a new group come back on. Bill, the ball game tonight saw a young man, Underwood, who impressed me very much with his poise and his ability to change speeds and really get our big hitters to swing at bad pitches. Yes, uh, he was masterful. Sox were hitting the ball into the air most of the time. Again, the White Sox pitchers uh, didn't pitch uh, bad baseball. Uh, could have been a two to one game, certainly. The uh, Tigers, had, as they did earlier in the season, Jim, just stole with impunity. They just run at will. When you send uh, Rusty Staub, one of the slowest people in the history of baseball, down to second, that doesn't uh, say much for uh, Detroit's respect for. White Sox pitcher's ability to hold the uh, 
runners close, although tonight I really thought that uh, they were stealing on the catcher. I didn't hear what you had to say, but that's yeah, how I saw Yeah, so I did too. Bill Gleason, thank you very much. We're going to take you back to the studio now for a film. This is Jimmy Pearsall with my guest Bill Gleason saying thank you very much. yourself in a jam we better check that out in the press box i can't believe it's sunday doubleheader sunday all right it will be played sunday in spite of the fact that they play a night game saturday night and i thought that was against but i suppose because of a rescheduling uh Perhaps the players are forced to permit it. I know why, Harry. It's getaway day for the All-Star break, and I got a plane to catch at 540. <laughs> I want to go to Lake Geneva, too. <laughs> All right, that's it. The one game played, the White Sox lose it by the score of 4-1. to one. They never did announce the crowd. Jake, can we get that before we leave? Just pick up that phone. That ought to be interesting. I, let's take a guess. I'll say... I'd say 51 or 2,000. You would. I'll say 49.58. But the other time when we had the Red Sox here, I'd have sworn there were 50,000 people because they were jammed in the aisles just as they were here all through that first game. I think they only seat 43,000 here. No attendances yet. All right, we can't hold on any longer. There's some great programming coming up here on Channel 44, and I know you're anxious to see it. Well, we're, we're sorry that we couldn't bring you both ends of the doubleheader. Channel 44 particularly regrets it, but there was certainly nothing that the television people could do about it, nor our radio station for, for that matter, because this one was in the hands of the, of the promoter of the event, which was the... Uh, uh, rock and roll station loop. Looped. So they, they certainly this place. they certainly showed the power of their station in drawing an audience and being able to influence them uh, to patronize the ballpark. But unfortunately, they weren't quite as ruly or as well governed as perhaps we all hoped they might have been. So that just about wraps it up now with Jimmy Pearsall, Harry Carey, wishing you all a very pleasant good evening from Comiskey Park, where an unannounced, very large total of baseball fans saw the White Sox drop the first game of the doubleheader to a very good-looking Detroit Tiger team under Sparky Anderson by the score of 4-1, to one, and where they have the second game called necessitating a doubleheader Sunday afternoon. See you Saturday night on Channel 44. So long, everybody. Park filled to capacity has never seen anything like it. Thousands of young people worked up by a named Steve Dahl. His anti-disco night, it got out of hand. The White Sox promotion obviously backfired when the fans, the young ones, took the demonstration much too seriously, spilled out of their seats, mobbing the field, as you can see. The game delayed over two hours. And police have actually set up barricades now to keep people out of the area of the stadium. Rosemary Gully is there with a live report. Rosemary is not there with a live report. As you can imagine, the scene outside the stadium, as you saw inside, is very chaotic. And uh, it is our policy not to add to the situation. Terry, uh, I know you were about to uh, introduce uh, Al Lerner, who was there when the action started. May I do the honor since we don't have Rosemary. Tell us what happened, Al. Well, very simply, Joel, as you say, a, a disco promotion. This is anti-disco demolition night. The whole idea of this promotion, uh, Steve Dahl on his morning show, blows up disco records. Tonight at Comiskey Park, in, a, in with the White Sox, a dual promotion to blow up thousands of disco records. The idea was for 98 cents, for anybody people. can get into the, uh, to the ballpark for 98 cents and a disco uh, and a disco record brought 50,000 people. I believe that Rosemary uh, Gully is ready out in the field. And if we can go to Rosemary, we'll go to her right now for her report. I'm ready to go. You know, it was a combination of a lot of things out here. 
and it's called You Can Blame It on the Disco, because a local rock radio station had a promotion out here tonight, whereas they wanted to blow up disco. So they distributed records and had a demonstration out on the field. So that, the heat, and a lot of drugs, and uh, just a very unruly crowd presented the problem. I talked to the deputy chief who told me that they knew that this was brewing around 4 o'clock. Anyway, I did talk to some people as they were leaving after the first game. Can we go to that tape? It just started out, you know, everybody was getting ready for it and they got all hyper. They started throwing stuff back and forth and then... Why did they get all hyper? Yeah. Well, they wanted to blow up the disco records. They don't like them. Steve Dow came out, they blew up all the records, and the people went wild. They went onto the fields, they lit fires, it just went wild. I'm really a Sox fan, and it just got out of hand. These people are good people. It just got out of hand. Too many people, that's all. Al and Tim, who's to fault? Who, 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 is, to, who is at fault for this happening? Well, we, st we have to start, of course, the, the White Sox have to take uh, ultimate responsibility for what happens in their park. Bill Vec uh, agreed to the promotion. Uh, they wanted to get a big crowd, and they got a big crowd at the ballpark. So it, it has to, responsibility has to be shared by both the radio station, who hyped this, uh, this event for weeks and weeks on the radio. The whole idea is to get people angry and to get them really anti-disco, bring them to the ballpark, and give them uh, their, uh, their due. Now, here we are. Earlier in the evening, 50,000 people estimated uh, at the ballpark, and uh, everybody's having a good time, but we knew that there was a problem there. Lots of fans on the outside who couldn't get into the ballpark, uh, estimates up to 5,000 who were climbing in. This is Steve Dahl, the uh, jockey, and he is on the field speaking to 500 uh, to 50,000 fans, and then the disco explosion. This is what they all came to see. Fireworks first, and then all the records the people brought blown up. It was at that point that everybody was looking around for something to happen. And when one person ran onto the field in center field, this is what ensued. I was standing on the field with our uh, camera crew shooting this, and it was one of the most horrifying sights you can imagine, standing out there and watching 5,000 people run towards you. Bill Veck, of course, has to be dejected, thinking about whether or not he can ever run in promotions like this again. And finally, it took the Chicago police to sweep the area to get the people uh, off the park. Uh, Steve Dahl, the, the disc jockey, was nowhere to be found uh, as soon as this was going on, and it was a unfortunate, an unfortunate error in planning by both the White Sox and the radio station. They didn't understand the magnitude of what they, uh, what they had started, and then it got out of hand. There were a lot of boos, of course, in the ballpark, and uh, a lot of drugs, as Rosemary said, too. The, the smell of marijuana, of course, very pungent in the air. We've just learned that the second game has been called we assume that means the White Sox have forfeited that game, and now they're going to just try to clear the area and get everybody home and try to forget about this night at the ballpark. What is this going to do to Bill Vex promotions in the future, Tim? I, I really don't know, but this is obviously the, uh, you know, those people weren't vicious. They weren't really mean. Nobody was injured that we know of, but, man, it was just too crazy. You can't blow up records in the middle of a baseball field and expect that 50,000 people to just say, hey, let's get on with the next game. We'll have more on the uh, Comiskey Park scene uh, later on in the news. Thank, Thank you, Tim. Thank you, Al. Thank, Thank you, Rose Marie. Second game was postponed until Sunday after Detroit won the opener 4-1. to one. The crowd, a full house of approximately 49,000 fans. The first game was all Tigers as Fred Howard lost to Pat Underwood. This triple by Tom Brookins drove home the eventual winning run in the second. The Tigers led 2-0. He went on to win in a breeze by a final of 4-1. to one. Everything was calm before that full house at this point, but as we reported at the top of our newscast, things turned unruly after that. On what was called Disco Demolition Night, a local disc jockey was allowed to blow up a bunch of disco records. That triggered pandemonium as the fans rushed the field, tore down the batting cage, and filled up Comiskey Park so you couldn't even see the grass anymore. This caused a second game to be postponed, as I mentioned, and I think maybe even Bill Veck learned a lesson tonight. Some gimmicks are sure to backfire. And... First run and Tom, or second run, Tom Brookins tripled into the left field corner to make it a two to nothing game. Greg Pryor drove in the only White Sox run of the game with a triple down into the left field corner, and here comes Rusty Torres around to score. But the Tigers went on to win it by a score of four to one, and of course, game two was canceled with all the activities happening out between games. Then on team night, WLUP held a disco demonstration. We'll talk about that a little bit more too. But game two was canceled out there 
this evening. As we said uh, between game activities, the main attraction, the disco demolition spearheaded by morning radio man Steve Dahl and his anti-disco army called the Insane Coho Lips. Earlier, I asked Steve just what he has against disco. Well, the first thing I have against it is that I can never find a white three-piece suit that fits me off the rack. <laughs> so uh, I hate the taste of pina coladas. I don't, I'm allergic to gold jewelry, so there's nothing there for me. Uh, I'm a cheapskate. I don't like to waste a lot of money at home, you know, in terms of my electrical bill, and you have to spend so much time blow drying your hair. It's a waste of energy, okay? I'm ecologically meaningful and cheap, so I'm not into it. I'd like to, uh, if I could, show you how we uh, destroy the disco records. And uh, this is how I do it. I have to kind of get worked up a little bit. Psych you. Yeah, I chant to myself, <laughs> coho lips, coho lips, and then I just... Oh, that felt good. Well, worthy as the cause may be, the idea of the game was to blow up disco records in a box out in the middle of center field. That did happen. Between games at tonight's doubleheader, a local disc jockey blew up disco records in center field, and a crowd responded by rushing the field. Police moved in. And it took them a considerable amount of time. A bonfire had been built in the middle of center field. Police tried to clear the unruly crowd, pushed them out. Finally got them off the field, although, again, it took a long time, perhaps some arrests. It's hard to tell. Some people appeared to be taken into custody. We don't know the exact nature of uh, everything that's gone on out there so far, but New Center 5 staffer Mike Pumo is out there at uh, Comiskey Park, and we have him on the phone right now. Mike? Hello. Jim. Yes, what's the, what's the current situation? They just canceled the second game. They canceled the second game because the... Because of, uh, the field is unplayable, as determined by the umpires. Also, would they have run into a problem with the fact that uh, they had such a long delay because of this? Yeah, there's a 1 a.m. curfew, and uh, so they would have had to complete the game by 1 a.m., but the main reason was because the umpires determined that the, that the field was unplayable. Uh, they had to clean it up, I suppose. It looks like there's a lot of litter out there from the picture we have. Right. What happened was that uh, they had an anti-disco demonstration between the games, and the fans stormed the field, and they set a bonfire in center field, and they also ripped up some turf in front of the pitcher's mound, about a foot, a foot wide and about 10, 12 feet long. And uh, they had a meeting with Sparky Anderson and Don Kessinger and Bill Vecht, and one of the supervisors, the umpires, was here along with the head umpire. And uh, after that meeting, I guess they've decided to cancel the game. Okay. Any injuries that you know of? Not that I know of. Uh, we have no reports of any arrests either as of right now. Okay. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Mike Pumo, who was out there at that White Sox game and uh, saw what you just saw and more, I guess to cover that particular story for about yeah. a week and a half now and the disc jockey involved Steve Is Dahl. That the guy who was cracking the record yeah, of the Yeah, you'll see him in okay. a second, but you know, he doesn't really plan to have anything like this happen and uh, you know, I know he's probably going to catch a lot of flack for it and it's undeserved, but you know, we'll talk more about okay. that as the week goes on. A packed house out at Comiskey Park tonight on Teen Night and there was more happening of course than just the Twilight Night doubleheader scheduled with the Detroit Liberty is happening out between games then on Teen Night WLUP held a disco demonstration we'll talk about that a little bit more too but game two was canceled out there this evening the main attraction the disco demolition spearheaded by morning radio man Steve Dahl and his anti-disco army called the insane coho lips earlier I asked Steve just what he has against disco well the first thing I have against it is that I can never find a white three-piece suit that fits me off the rack <laughs> so I hate the taste of pina coladas I don't, I'm allergic to gold jewelry, so there's nothing there for me. Uh, I'm a cheapskate. I don't like to waste a lot of money at home, you know, in terms of my electrical bill, and you have to spend so much time blow drying your hair. It's a waste of energy, okay? I'm ecologically meaningful and cheap, so I'm not into it. I'd like to, uh, if I could, show you how we uh, destroy the disco records. And uh, this is how I do it. I have to kind of get worked up a little bit. Psych yeah, I chant to myself, coho lips, coho lips, and then I just... Oh, that felt good. 
well, worthy as the cause may be, <laughs> the idea of the game was to blow up disco records in a box out in the middle of center field. That did happen, but after that is when the fans overran the field. Biography, the book which he called Vec, as in wreck, wherein the Chicago White Sox owner told of the promotional gimmicks he'd invented over the years to get crowds out to the ball game. But last night it came from Bill Vec's son, a gimmick that left no doubt that the boy's name rhymes with Rec 2. This from Norma Quarles. 50,000 people, the largest crowd of the season, showed up at Chicago's Comiskey Park for the twinite doubleheader between the White Sox and the Detroit Tigers. 15,000 others had to be turned away. Many had come for Disco Demolition Night, a promotional gimmick. Between games, as planned, a huge box containing thousands of disco records was blown up. The rest was unplanned. Fans stormed out onto the field in the thousands. Disco records were hurled like frisbees. Bonfires were set. Bottles were thrown. The batting cage was torn down and destroyed. Fistfights broke out. White Sox players had to be locked in their clubhouse for their own protection. The melee lasted an hour and a half and resulted in 39 arrests and a few minor injuries. The baseball fans missed the second game. It was canceled. The White Sox lost it. It was forfeited to Detroit. Norma Quarles, NBC News, Chicago. This kick off Thursday night. Some 7,000 persons ran out into the field and turned a promotional gimmick, disco demolition night, into a fiasco. They started bonfires, tore up the field, and created havoc in general. It was a wild scene for some 20 minutes until police finally began clearing the area. Despite the uproar, no one was seriously injured. Work crews moved in Friday to clean up the mess. Experienced observers say that the rioting was not caused by White Sox fans. An admission fee of 98 cents brought in people who usually never attend baseball games. There were 50,000 in the park and thousands of others had to be turned away. The anti-disco promotion was the brainchild of WLUP-FM disc jockey Steve Dahl. I want to stress the fact that we didn't plan on that happening. It wasn't like part of the deal, like a promotional stunt. It just happened. These things happen sometimes when you get large crowds together, especially a volatile crowd that's been drinking a little bit. Uh, but we are going to sit down and talk about some future things and uh, certainly take all the things we've learned from last night and all the previous times into consideration before, before we plan anything. Bill Vex's son, Mike, has been doing some sports casting for WLUP. Dahl says Mike will continue to work for the station. This is Frank Rios reporting for News 9. And because of last night's disturbance... Now, my next guest tonight, a gentleman who'll be joining us a little bit later on, is truly crazed. His name is Steve Dahl, and he is a disc jockey for station WLUP-FM out in Chicago, Illinois. And he hates disco music. He hates it so bad that he brings helium to the studio, inhales it, and imitates the Bee Gees on the air, and then breaks up their records. Now, as it turns out, there are a lot of people in Chicago who hate disco as much as does Steve Dahl of WLUP. I've got some videotape, now don't go to it just yet, some videotape of an anti-disco rally which Steve put on at Comiskey Park in Chicago on the 12th of July this year. You all know that Comiskey is the home of the Chicago White Sox. He told his listeners that all they had to do to get into the ballpark that night was come with 98 cents and a disco record, which could be placed on a large pile and blown up between games of a doubleheader. They sold 50,000, they sold 15,000 tickets to the baseball game. But by the time the disco demolition thing came around, there were 50,000 people in the stands and 40,000 more people outside screaming to get in. Now, it was described by Greg Gumbel of station WMAQ-TV in Chicago. Let's go to the videotape. Let's pick it up right here between games, Comiskey Park, July 12, 1979. It was, first of all, the biggest crowd anyone has seen at Comiskey Park in many a day. An estimated 50 to 55,000 inside the park, another 10 to 15,000 outside. Between games, WLUP Steve Dahl led his followers in song and chants on the field and then proceeded to blow up the disco records collected in a box in center field. Then, the unscheduled event. Some seven to 10,000 fans overran the field, tearing up bases and sod, and causing a delay of over an hour and a half. 
Chicago police finally cleared the field, but too late to save game two of the doubleheader. The field was declared unplayable, and the game was canceled. Now, why would they get upset about that? I mean, here in New York, it is not an unusual happening when fans rush out onto the field at Yankee Stadium. They don't go out there to blow up records at Yankee Stadium. They want to take, uh, they want to take uh, Reggie Jackson home with them. That's what they do at Yankee Stadium. In any event, Steve Dahl did not shed any tears over the fact that the Chicago White Sox had to forfeit the game. As he says, they weren't in first place anyway. He'll join us tonight. We have Meatloaf with us and a few more surprises. We'll be right back after these words from our sponsors. Now from Chicago, here's Mr. Steve Dahl, a disc jockey at WLUP-FM out there, and the man who single-handedly was responsible for a riot at Comiskey Park. On, you don't want to be known no, as a riot. No, I'm ashamed stuff. of myself. No, don't be. It's not you. It's the people who ran out on that field that should take the responsibility. I took blame. As a matter of fact, I went home and uh, after the uh, alleged riot, and I went back home to Los Angeles to my mom's house and had her spank me soundly for two weeks. And you I enjoyed it. it too, right? Yeah, he was injured. I enjoyed I it. Cat and so did she. <laughs> and she's now suing my father for divorce, and we're getting married in about three weeks, and I'm kind of proud to make the announcement here on the show. <laughs> what kind of people do I hate? I got this guy coming on here saying, you know, I got this guy over here. Why do you hate this? Why do you hate disco so much? Well, I can't find a... Can I take this off? Sure I feel silly sitting here. It's, the only, right it's the only reason we brought you here. So, you know, if you want to take it off... Well, I do look good in uniform, and I know you like guys in uniform. And... <laughs> That's right. That's right. You like that. You know, my name, this is, this is kind of... Uh, I'm going to pass it on. Coincidental. My, my real name is Spam, and I changed it to Steve Dahl. Yeah. And your name is Meatloaf, and... Of course, that's not your real name, and you changed your real name to Meatloaf. It's kind of coincidental. Spam, see, that's a meat product, and it comes in a loaf. You're on a roll. It's a little smaller. Yeah. Good, Steve. Let's talk I about, thought about Chicago. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I thought about calling myself Turkey Frank for a while and nah. change it to Steve Dahl. I hate disco because I can't find a white three-piece suit that fits me off the rack that hangs well, and uh, you got to have one of those. Reason, that's exactly the same reason that I dislike disco. And I'm allergic exactly. to gold jewelry. Oh, see, and I don't I'm like allergic. pina coladas. I'm allergic to coconut. So mm -hmm. what does it uh, hold for me? Probably nothing. <laughs> nothing. I can't dance. One leg is shorter than the other. I, uh, he's, see, he's I, had a worse childhood than me. Have, have <laughs> one you, leg shorter than the other one. Have you had lunch with Bill Paley recently? <laughs> <laughs> no. no. <laughs> I've had lunch with Bill Veck recently, though. Oh, the guy who uh, runs the team out right? there in Chicago. Yeah, yeah, he was pretty upset with me. And he beat me about the face, too, for a while. And he has a wooden leg. And that didn't... Uh, Weren't you me. amazed that uh, 50,000 people turned out to uh, vent their venom on disco records that oh, night? Oh, yes. Yeah, we thought we'd probably get 20 or 30,000, actually. Yeah. And uh, there were enough security people there to handle that many. But uh, they were too crazed, and there were too many of them. And that's where the problems really... Uh, yeah. Occurred. Well, listen, it's not record what we business was good that week. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> they sold like 90,000. Yeah, the record companies, they complain to you know, me. They Chicago. say, Steve, what are you doing? You're destroying the industry. I said, no, I'm not. They buy rock and roll records, and now they buy disco records, too, to blow them up. They love it. As a matter of fact, I have some here tonight. I thought we could. Would you like to break one with me? Can we do this? You can do anything you want, Steve. I got to. No, I like Saturday staying alive. Fever. No, see, I can't help it. I like staying alive. Oh, come on. No, you I can't can. say that. So you can't like see, any of it. No, I got. I, I like staying alive. What You're going to you? hurt your rock and roll record sales. No, no. I'm, I like Steve, staying alive. Staying alive. The courage is great of your team. convictions. Remove that record from Meatloaf's hands yeah, and here, smash it into a million it. pieces. Right. Go ahead, break it. Get it out of your system so these now. These guys Steve. are friends of mine. You're in trouble. These guys are friends oh, of no, mine. You're in trouble. The village people. They're friends of mine. And I did. Listen, her real name is Gaines. You know that? I did hair with her sister Linda. I mean, how? Wait a second. Hold it. Is that a brand new? record hold it this is 12.95 come on i got a receipt here i need to talk to somebody about this too is this a production expense but i, I mean, can there get there are a lot of people who would like to have this record we don't want to just break it into a million Fred, pieces there are kids Fred. in india that want bg's records i know i've seen that sally they, struthers talks yeah, about yeah. it oh, they send your disco records to india she yeah they, they the trade them for food there yeah. <laughs> well, it's i i do it right on my head it's very simple it's just a there <laughs> and actually you know what to Get serious for a second so the entire country doesn't think I'm a raving idiot. <laughs> <laughs> My parents aren't watching tonight. Really? It's, it's not so much the music that I dislike. It's actually the culture. And, and we're a rock and roll station. The Loop is in Chicago. It's uh, true. Hardcore rock and roll station. And it's actually quite intimidating to... Uh, uh, to our audience, to myself, to most rock and rollers, because you have to look perfect. Your hair has to be beautiful. And 
I'm sure you don't want to do I, one? I, I did. I mean, I, I mm. did, you know. Would you like to do one? No, you know thanks. What, you know, I you don't. can use the helmet. It doesn't hurt. No, no, I don't You know what like Ted Nugent things. said? Uh, I saw Ted Nugent last Saturday. You know what he said about it? He said he was glad for disco because it kept him away from his concerts. <laughs> says, These guys don't come close to me, boy. They stay away from me. Well, it's actually gotten out of proportion, you know, because uh, New York, the media centers in Los Angeles are so into it now. And the trendy ad men go down to Studio 54 and uh, put on try a dress and, and say, hi, let's have a good time. Uh, sailor? <laughs> Pretend they're Margaret Trudeau. <laughs> and, uh, I did that once. It worked. Yeah? Yeah, I pretended I was that Kate Smith. That might have been me. That might have been me. I went through the Studio 54 singing, God bless America. You know who uh, Ethel Merman has a disco album out now? Yeah. It's very interesting to hear him. Alexander's uh, ragtime band, Disco. Andy, get your gun, Disco. Yeah, yeah. I got all it's that good. stuff. It's good. It's good stuff. But anyway, it's intimidating. We're just trying to put it back in perspective. It's not that important. I don't want to see Margaret Trudeau's face anymore on the cover of anything with her little see-through dress on, you know, or Ellie McGraw and she doesn't have a bra on, and I'm not interested, you know? You know, they get, they, they get time, you know. Ali McGraw and now Margaret Trudeau will have to get equal time over there. He asked me to do that. What, equal time? To get him on. <laughs> oh, okay. What is insane coho lips? Oh, that's drug-inspired. You were talking about drugs? Let's talk about them. I don't experiment with them because I don't need to experiment anymore. I know exactly what I'm doing with them now. It's all, it's all taken care of. I, oh, yeah, one of those, one of those. In Chicago, they have a gang, they have a gang, a street gang. Several, yeah. Called the Insane Unknowns, which I think is an interesting name for a Mexican street gang. You know, somehow in a cosmic uh, flash, they thought, Insane Unknowns, let's be that. And I took the insane from them, the coho from coho salmon in uh, Lake Michigan, and lips because... Everybody's got them. Yeah, yeah. that too. And it means nothing but uh, we are the insane coho lips. That's the anti-disco army. That's what we call ourselves okay. in Chicago. Right. Now, what is this thing you do with the helium? We had some... I bought you some helium tonight. I know, I appreciate it. All right, can you, can you do that for me with the, uh, where you do the BGs? Yeah, there, we have it down here, I think, much like a, we could pass we this around and I... <laughs> <laughs> I swear, some guy right now at home, I, I never swear they were stuff, passing a hookah around on the Tomorrow Show. <laughs> what is going on? I stopped on? doing that in 69, you know, after I opened to Hendrix, and I really did. You yeah, know. spent it's, all me day. Me and Hendrix were backstage doing this stuff once, and we were really out there. <laughs> no fooling? I'm kidding, Tom. Oh, it's I never joke, know with you. Well, you get very lightheaded from this. <laughs> all right, I... Oh, <laughs> excuse me. Okay. Am I... Go ahead and give me some... Uh, Hi. Yeah, that sounds good. Okay. I didn't want to get more in here. I just wanted to test it. I will now do. I'm sure you would like to do. Whoa. Whoa. I'm seeing God. And he looks like You see Negro. blue? He looks like You see Negro. any blue? You yeah. see a little blue? He looks like you. I'm sorry to question. 62. <laughs> Well, you can tell by the way I use my walk, I'm a Chinese cook. <laughs> what do you think? I can't, would you, I try no, to... No, 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 hey, no. No, oh, no. Whoa. No, no, uh, listen, I'll blow away. Hey, let's blow get away. some little what finger, finger sandwiches now. I'm real hungry. That makes me hungry. So that's what we oh, do. Is that it? We... That's the whole thing. That's tune? the end of it? You don't do the Bee Gees? You know, well, that was the Bee Gees. You can tell by the way I walk, I'm a Chinese cook. What's, ver right. what's the second line? Well, I don't know. I'll do more if you want. Oh, yeah, give me I, see, But I can't do too much at one time as I'll pass out here. That's okay. <laughs> That's okay. No, I'm already... The show's almost over. Already you, go you go down, you go down. It'll be great. It'll, it'll, it'll be great. If you're going to go out, go out on TV. Exactly. Man, I mean, go Chicago. out. You know? Hey, listen, let me ask you a question. Yeah. Do you want to go out on an FM station in Chicago? If you're going to go, pal, you might as well go on 175 big ones coast to coast. That's you're right. right. All right, here right we go. Here, here show we go. time. I got... But I am in a lot of trouble in Chicago. I got... They have a... State fair there, Chicago Fest, like a state fair for Chicago. I walk in, I'm just enjoying myself eating beef on a stick, you know, and walking around. <laughs> and the police see me. It's a corny dog. Steve Dahl, and they came. No, it wasn't. It was uh, teriyaki. It was oh, that stuff. Steve Dahl, they came and kicked don't me do out. That. No, if it makes you funny, don't do it anymore. I don't want you to hurt yourself. I really well, I'll don't. do one more quick. No, don't hurt yourself. Promise. Let me. him do one I'm more. I'm addicted to it, okay? I'm going to be honest with you. I've been off this stuff for three months. I do one it once. Like I it's all out. over, you know? You one time. Me back well, hey, and I suppose you're going to sell me the second luck, you know, take, right? You're going to sell me it for 50 Hurry, I got we're five seconds. We're going to take it out of the street. How deep is your love? How deep is your love? I really need to know. Give me a chance. Now these announcements for the NBC television stations. We will continue. Wow. Woo! Now don't ask me why. All right, here we go. Oh, boy. <laughs> Well, we'll all be saying goodnight now for yeah, the NBC. Yeah. Yeah, we'll all be saying. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's really. Oh, you see a little boy. I don't believe it.
My thanks to Meatloaf. My thanks to Stan Dahl, uh, Steve Dahl. Never, yeah, never, never wants to watch the difference. Right. Right. Whoopi! Thank you all for watching, and good night, everybody, from New York City. <laughs> While in New York, guests of the Tomorrow Show stayed at the elegant St. Moritz Hotel on Central Park South, near major corporate headquarters, Fifth Avenue Shopping, and the Theater District. Hotel accommodations furnished in exchange for this announcement. Disco and how it's changing. In the remaining lazy years of the 70s, people were ready for a new sound and a new star. And when both came along in one shining package, the impact was explosive. Saturday Night Fever was an international hit with a kind of rare force capable of starting new trends. Travolta's white suit became the uniform for the young disco dancer. The public rushed to discotheques that had cloned the aura of Travolta's world, recreating the total environment of flashing lights from the ceiling to the dance floor. Couples were dancing together again. They looked more like the ballroom spectacles of the 40s than the rock and roll set. And the mass media turned the craze into a gold mine. The soundtrack of Saturday Night Fever became the biggest selling album in history, grossing $215 million worldwide. The movie itself brought in over $100 million. Chicago radio stations were soon programming their entire day with the danceable up-tempo beat. And disco even saved Rush Street. When Mr. Kelly's folded, everybody thought Rush Street would head for the beat joints and strip parlors. Live music was gone. And then discotheques sprang up, attracting hundreds of thousands of people down here at night. Millions of dollars were spent on the flashing lights and the sound systems and restaurants to serve the dancing public. And once again, Rush Street got hot. <laughs> An enterprising promoter put disco on wheels and into the movies. Even the black radio market in Chicago, which has traditionally snapped its fingers to the tune of its own drummer, has been affected by the disco craze. Tom Joyner is a top personality at WJPC in the morning and at the Happy Medium Disco Mondays and Fridays. At both places, he is a disc jockey with a special black disco sound. Black disco music is... Uh, is, is could be classified as funk, okay? For instance, like a, a music like this. That's funk. That's the trend. Hey, that funk. Smell it. <laughs> All right. Funk is a ham hock in your cornflakes. All right, Bill Curtis, you want some funk? Here is some funk. This is Bootsy and the Rubber Band. Yeah, I'm a double dude, baby. But as the 70s came to a close, so did the disco trend. Within the past year, disco records have dropped in sales from 60 to 70% of the market down to 5%. The disco radio stations are beginning to mix their disco sound with pop and rock music. Many listeners attracted to the pounding beat in the first place found a steady diet to be a Chinese water torture in sound. Disco owners feel people will still come to dance, but the unending thirst for the pounding disco beat appears to have been quenched. In Chicago, as in no other city, disco's demise has been hastened by a curious mixture of a Chicago radio station, clever promotion, and a disc jockey named Steve Dahl. It's an intimidating uh, lifestyle and culture, and I think there are enough uh, uh, in intimidating factors in the world these days that you don't need something uh, ridiculous and absurd like that uh, to make you feel like a jerk because you can't get into it and slide and hang out and snort pina coladas. Dahl is talking about a resentment toward disco among the young. He's been exploiting that feeling for less than a year, breaking records on the air and forming an anti-disco army of followers. To his surprise, his phantom radio army turned out to be real. The movement against disco spilled onto the field at Comiskey Park. Evidence that Dahl and the Loop had touched a responsive nerve among its young listeners. Not only did it help cut short the disco craze, but it catapulted an FM radio station into Chicago radio history. That report tomorrow. Tonight, our second report on the impact of disco music on the pop culture of the 70s. It became a battle between disco music fans and those against the fad. It's the story of a disc jockey and his radio station who tried to kill the disco mania. 
Steve Dahl with you. And Gary Meyer. And man, we're in trouble again. <laughs> Look at this. The two radio men whipped up the emotions of teenagers against disco music. And when they gathered their small army at Comiskey Park, the park lost. That was July. Dahl was barred from Chicago Fest, but the station's promotion manager hawked t-shirts and wound up selling 225,000 to date. In six months, a half million pieces of promotional material will be sold or given away. By summer's end, it was Chicago radio history. While Wally Phillips is still the acknowledged king of the morning, Steve Dahl has become the crown prince, attracting the biggest share of teens and young adults, according to ARB. They had knocked off the rock giant, WLS, all with an anti-disco thrust and a unique cool. disc yeah. jockey. Sell it. Do, 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 do. I like to dance with girls in sleazy dresses, lipstick, nail charms, and makeup in excesses. Do you think I'm disco? Am I superficial? Yeah. Look at it, it's my only goal. The sun hasn't come up yet in Chicago, but more than 200 of the faithful have come to the Carnegie Theater to hear and see their leader. And this is a loop, the Coho Breakfast Club, as we uh, head into the last hour here for a disgustingly rancid lima bean day. Okay. Any resemblance to the Breakfast Club of Don McNeil is purely coincidental. This is a mixture of high school talent show and Saturday Night Live. Will it be kept confidential from my parents. <laughs> the doctor gets drunk and calls people up. <laughs> hey, you know what? <laughs> hey, this is a guy that's going out with that 17-year-old virgin. <laughs> Am I somebody that they should know? No, but we're not in the Chicago guidebooks. <laughs> <laughs> I'm John Drummond, and hey, does this cigar smell bad or what? <laughs> Come on. But you're going to be walking near the Michigan Avenue Bridge. You should be advised that Ted Kennedy is going to be crossing that soon, and uh, be careful, okay? I'm like a girl in high school that puts out for everybody. You know, I'm getting a bad rep. And when I kiss, I just, uh, a lot of people, you know, when I'm going to, like, Janet and I are going to be romantic or something, I'll uh, just take a little section of an odor eater and chew on it. Mm -hmm. like His that. radio voice resembles Mickey Rooney, but he looks more like John Belushi. What's so appealing about Dahl? For teenagers, it's that rebellious streak, saying the unspeakable, using sexual innuendos, being irreverent, making fun of anybody. His material ranges from gutter tripe to social commentary. I guess, basically, I get paid for uh, uh, doing what they used to kick me out of school for, which I think is a wonderful thing, just being stupid. These are the things I do on the air every day are the things that they used to send me out in the hallway for. Competitor Tom Joyner of WJPC likes Dahl, but has reservations about his movement. I know some people that walk down the street with, with, with uh, something, on their, something on their shirts or on the back of their jackets that says disco, and, and some, of those, some of his, what do you call Dahl's army or whatever they are, they almost got jumped on and stuff, you know. He's, um, he's, 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 he, could, he could very well be a very dangerous person. <laughs> Dahl's anti-disco record has sold a half million copies in three months. His latest, recorded Monday, capitalizes on another emotional issue. Ooh, you got a real nice beard, real nice beard. You know it really caught on my eye, Otola. But you know your mind is weird, your mind is weird. You really are a nutty kind of guy, Otola. Come on. Media critics call him inventive, creative, funny. But his humor is raw, unfiltered, seemingly without limits. And that's just the way he wants it. Breaking new ground in comedy. One reason they can still say... We have a remarkable radio station. Except for one little incident. Well, when he quit school and we found out about it five months later, yes, that was a little over the line. <laughs> Nine years later, Steve doesn't need diplomas, but he does need a daily dose of audience adoration. He needs it. It's like a fix for him, being able to have the audience like him, care about him. They don't just like him, they idolize him. His fans range from the very young through 14-year-olds with braces to 35-year-old bankers. Steve claims they're all crazy, but he does truly appreciate them. They're wonderful. I couldn't make my house payments without them, because I'm not qualified to do anything else but dig ditches. 
actually, Steve is into a lot of other things, and he's doing quite well at all of them. Do you think I'm disco? Cause I spent so much time blow drying out my hair. His record's a big national hit, and now he's working on a comedy album. In addition, he's putting together a weekly television show, and he's marketing his own line of Hawaiian shirts. While Steve is occupied with his many business ventures, his 29-year-old wife, Janet, is in law school. I have to keep my husband out of jail. As you can see, he's been libelous on about eight occasions so far this morning. Do you have a lot of pending lawsuits? I have one pending right now, that's all. And that's as a result of Comiskey Park. What happened at Comiskey Park? <laughs> Boy, you got me, I'll tell you. No one really knows for sure. It was the high point of Steve's anti-disco campaign where he blew up thousands of disco records in the middle of Comiskey Park. The only problem was the swarms of kids who almost tore down the park. Steve says it wasn't his fault, but still he's become more conservative and now destroys only one record at a time. <laughs> I don't know what you all think of him, but I predict that he's going to be a major national star at Absolutely. some point in the near future. He's outrageous, he's irreverent, but he truly is one of the most Very talented creative. people. I think he's history. going to be all washed up before he's 30. I'm glad, I hope Steve, uh, Steve's he'll, watching. He'll he'll probably, you'll probably uh, hear from him, Joel. Just try to be honest, Steve. <laughs> That's the news for this Friday night. I'm Terry Murphy. And I'm, I'll give my right name, Joel Daly. <laughs> Jack Jones reports Weekend Eyewitness News next. Good evening. Have a great weekend.